Okay. Well, I'm, I'm really happy to be talking to this audience. Uh, I came here more to learn than to teach, but uh, I hope I can tell you some things that maybe you don't know, especially about Haskell. You probably not about C++ so much. So, uh, this, this will be a three-part talk, so like the middle, middle part will be split between two segments. Uh, the first one is, is sort of an introductory, introduction both to Haskell and, to, and a refresher on template metaprogramming. Um, so, why Haskell and C++? This, this seems like complete opposites, right? I mean, Haskell is this functional, pure, elegant language, and C++ is like the opposite of that, right? <laughs> <laughs> I know, uh, you know, we love C++, uh, only like a mother can love an ugly child. <laughs> <laughs> Right, uh, but it's uh, it's amazing that actually the same ideas, the functional ideas from Haskell, are getting into C++ and and actually like at the forefront of this movement was always Boost was always at the forefront of this movement, um, not so much as as the well both at runtime using lambdas. Um, and at compile time, using metaprogramming, there was always a, f a s very strong functional aspect to it. So why Haskell? Uh, why do I want to talk about Haskell at all? Uh, it, it has easy syntax, because it's a single paradigm language. It's just functional language, nothing else. So, since it has only one paradigm to support, the syntax is really easy and very very terse. So, you, it takes some getting used to it, uh, but once you get used to it, it's really, you can read Haskell without problems. There's almost one-to-one -one match with C++ template metaprogramming. This is pretty amazing, because if you try other uh, functional languages like ML, um, they don't really translate that easily. But Haskell is like perfect match. Uh, you have to take into account the differences, so I'll be upfront about this. Uh, in Haskell, all, all the code that I'll be showing you in Haskell, that, that's a runtime code. This is what happens when you run the program, right? Whereas uh, the examples I'll show you in C++ are pure compile time. And in com at compile time, C++ is a pure functional language, just like Haskell. There's no mutation, you operate, actually you operate on types, so you don't mutate types. Um, and uh, in Haskell you, you, you operate on, on regular data types, on integers, structures, or whatever. Uh, whereas in uh, uh, compile time C++, in metaprogramming, you operate on types. But types have such big uh, structure that they that you can express so much with types that's that's plenty plus you can use integers to parameterize your templates so you parameterize your templates with types and integer yes wouldn't you say uh, that laziness is another major difference between uh, Haskell and C++ at compile time <coughs> is it really I mean, well, C++, yeah. It's definitely not lazy in C++. Um, uh, it, okay, is, is, is laziness the difference between Haskell? Haskell is a very lazy language. Okay, it doesn't... Completely lazy. Right? Completely lazy the laziest of the languages. <laughs> right? <laughs> now, I'm, I'm not sure what it means to be lazy at compile time. Do you know? Well, um, yeah, so... so in Haskell, you can operate on infinite sequences, for example. Oh, oh okay. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. And if you try to do that in C++, it imperatively, eagerly will run down the sequence and, and you'll never come back, right? Right, you right. Blow the stack of the compiler. Right, yeah. You, you blow this, the yeah. compiler. Yeah, that's true. 
Well, yeah, you can you can make it lazy. That's true. You can make it lazy. Our normal our normal way of doing it isn't. Okay, so this is the plan for the first. Uh, I'll, I'll I'll make it forty five minutes. This first part. I'll try. Okay. Uh, and then we can have like five minutes to stretch uh, and then continue another 45 minutes. And, and that will be the next session also. I'll divide in 45 minutes. So uh, I'll talk about functions because we are talking functional language functions and the corresponding meta functions in C. I'll talk about lists, which is a rather new thing in C OX because it involves variadic templates. Um, I'll talk about higher order functions, something that is new to runtime C++, but has been there in compile time C++ for quite some time. Um, we'll talk about lambdas and closures, um, variadic templates that, that about list, lists, variadic templates and TPPs, which are template parameter packs. Um, I'll, I'll show you list comprehension in uh, C++. Uh, uh, I'll talk about continuations in uh, at metaprogramming, and there will be a little bibliography at the end. Here's a teaser. Okay, who? I mean, you are all guys do metaprogramming, so uh, is that? something that is understandable at this point or and should I like stop right here and go because <laughs> I'm, I'm going to explain this at some point at the end of the talk you should be able to understand this I mean, this is a short meta program okay so let's start with functions um, so what happened in, in uh, template metaprogramming is that it was sort of discovered in C++, I think. Somebody just noticed that they can implement a factorial uh, at compile time, and it was like a big discovery. And then this whole area of template metaprogramming started and f flourished. But uh, since it wasn't planned, in C++. In C++, templates were, in, were, were there mostly to support parameterized uh, types, things like containers, you know, parameterized functions maybe, but not for template metaprogramming. So, uh, so, so since it was discovered, it's... Um, did you guys um, watch these survivor programs on TV? where a guy is, is on a desert island and, and with sticks and, and a bit of uh, um, plastic bag, he, he can distill water and, and do all, all this kind of stuff. So, so in C++, this is what template metaprogramming looks like a little bit. You know, like in Haskell, you do it, you know, the easy way. In C++, you have to go through all these hoops because it wasn't designed from scratch. It was actually uh, found. So you, found, you find these sticks, you find a plastic bag, and we make do. <laughs> so this is the first program in Haskell, um, and it shows a lot of things. First of all, it shows uh, an extremely terse, terse syntax. So I'm defining a function, which I call fact for factorial, and I define it, I, I define it in a mathematical way. Right, so I'm saying factorial of zero, what is it? It's one, right? So that's a definition of factorial of zero. And then factorial of, of n, where n is non-zero, because the first case already took, took, uh, uh, took, took care of zero, right? So, so now n is non-zero, so it's a specialization uh, for, for any n other than zero. It's just n times factorial of n minus 1, right? So it calls itself recursively. That's, that's very... And then you can type fact of 4 and it will give you the result, which I think is 24, is it? Something like that. Um, so, um, now, now the syntax is very terse. You, you, you don't see parentheses, neither when you are defining a, a function or when you are calling. 
the, the fact that I put, put parentheses uh, uh, after fact here in the second line is because I want to tell Haskell that to first evaluate n minus 1 and then call factorial with it. It's not because I'm putting arguments in, in parentheses. It's just that, that Haskell is greedy in, in getting its, its, uh, its argument, so it would think, okay, factorial of n and then minus 1. Okay. So this is this code in C++. It's much more code, really. Um, this is expected, right? And the, the, the stuff in red, highlighted in red, this is, this is Haskell. The main difference here is that uh, I had to invert these. So I have two definitions of factorial here. Uh, I have two definitions of factorial here, but they are inverted. Because um, resolving a function call in Haskell is slightly different than it is in resolving a meta function call in C++. In Haskell, you just look one after another. So you first try factorial of zero. Right? Since I'm calling it with 4, that's no match. Okay, so I'm trying the next match, factorial of, of n. Does 4 match n? Yes. So I go on calculating. Right? In, in, in C++, it's, it's, uh, it's the best. First of all, uh, the compiler tries to find, find the best or narrowest match. It doesn't go this first, this next. And the other thing is that it has to see first the gen general case and then specializations. And uh, yeah, so, so, so this is the general case for any n. I'm defining it as a meta function that returns n times factorial of n minus 1. Um, now, the, the trick is to, to implement a function at compile time, uh, you really implement a struct, you, you just define a data type. And what it returns, it's a member of this struct, which has a special name, for instance, value. I think that's, that's the accepted uh, convention, but it's a convention. Okay, so I know when I call a meta function, I have to access double colon value. Okay, because by convention, it has something that's defined as value. And uh, this value has to be a static const int, because only those can be initialized at compile time. So I'm really, uh, so this is, this is, uh, um, this is the initialization of this compile time value, right? And this thing can be executed, uh, can be calculated at compile time. So the compiler just, okay, says, okay, I have to initialize this, so I have to evaluate this at compile time, so it goes there and says, okay, so I, I do this, expand this template, uh, this needs a further expansion and further expansion and so on, until it hits this, specialization here, okay, and until it hits zero. And then it says, okay, but this time I'm calculating factorial of zero, so I'll use the specialization because zero is a better match for zero than n, narrower. Okay, so this is a template specialization. Okay, and it's defined as one. And when I want to call factorial at compile time, right, I call the meta function with, with integer 4, I just do it and then put double colon value to extract the value. So this is a function call syntax in C++ TMP. So I want you to be able to like look at this code and see red. Okay, <laughs> don't see the black stuff and say, oh, this is a meta function, this is a meta function, oh, this is call, calling a meta function. It's just like in Haskell. I want to digress a little bit about types uh, in Haskell, because what I found out that when, when I'm looking at, at C++ template metaprogramming code, um, I, I, always, I, I usually put a comment there which explains to me what are the types of these, in these meta functions. 
so in, in, a meta function is just a template, right? And and you don't see any any um, well, you don't see any type either in either place, right? However, in in uh, in Haskell, it doesn't mean that these are not typed variables. Haskell is very strongly typed. It just does type inference for you. So I don't have to put types in there. In C++, I can. Uh, well, in this case, I'm putting an int. Okay, so this is type int. But in most cases, you just say class or type name, T, right? That, that, that can be anything. It can be any type. So, so uh, in, this, in this way, um, template metaprogramming is typeless. And of course, you know everything about um, how, how types can be introduced into template metaprogramming using concepts, which unfortunately didn't enter into C++ OX. But concepts would be the corresponding typing of meta functions. So in Haskell, um, Haskell is, has a um, you know, uh, a, a, a multiplicity of, of uh, multiplicity of types, uh, but but the most basic type um, in Haskell is a function type, right? Because it's a functional language. So function types, when you are writing what type something is, you write a function from type A to type B. You just say A arrow B. That's all. That's a function type. Okay, and type, type inference in, in Haskell, how it works. You can actually define factorial and then you, you can ask in the interpreter, what type is factorial? And it will type something like this. It will tell you factorial, well, it's a function type, right, from t to t. But what is t? Is it defined for integers only? Or is it defined, uh, is it defined for, uh, I don't know, lists? No, it's not defined for a list. You cannot calculate a factorial of, of, of a list. Why? Because here is a multiplication sign and here's the subtraction sign. So, so this type T has to have these two operators defined. So it looks who defines these operators. And it says, okay, it's, it's a type class. It's a class of types that have these two defined. And this class of types is called num. numbers. Okay? So this says if t is a number, then factorial is of type t goes into t. Okay? And if we had concept in C++, I could do the same. I could say, okay, ma uh, well, not, not in this case because this is an int, but in, in, in uh, future examples you will see I'm operating on types, right? And when I'm operating on types, I would like to narrow the types and say these are... Yes? Did you have to type the blue line yourself or is that uh, automatically it is, created by Haskell? It is automatically created by Haskell and I can ask Haskell what type have I just defined? Right? Or I can put this explicitly in my code and then Haskell will check it and tell me was I right or not. This is actually Haskell code, the, the blue line. So just the fact that you use the multiplication and subtraction, it uh, reduces the, the possible types to numbers, right? Exactly. It inferred the type class. The num in the parentheses, is that an existing? It's an existing predefined okay. type class. You can also define your own type classes and so on. So I'm just like with concepts. And you can have instances of your type classes. You can define instances, which is what ty type uh, map? Concept. Concept map, yes. Thank you. Yes? Can I overload operators? Hmm? Can I overload operators in Haskell? Uh, pointers? Can you overload, overload operators? Operators. <laughs> overload operators. Th this is the way to overload operators. This is the only way in which you can overload operators or overload functions by defining type classes. But that would mean that I can get the pointer 
are different types if I have overloaded operators for types that have a multiply operator. No. So the way Haskell works is that an that a function which includes operators, yeah. operators such as the syntax for functions, a function is defined for one type or one type class. And you can yes. over it to, uh, overload it to others. Mm -hmm. so what you can do is say, okay, for this type class, plus is defined. Mm -hmm. Plus is defined for the type of num. Mm -hmm. So anything that's an instance of num can say, okay, I implement plus this way. But something that is right. not an instance of num cannot define plus. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, okay, another example, predicates. Um, so we have a predicate is zero in Haskell. So again, uh, is zero of zero is true, is zero of anything else is false. In fact, I could put an underscore instead of x, which, which matches everything. Um, and if you ask the, the uh, Haskell what type it is, it will tell you, okay, it's, it's from uh, type class num, again, why, why does it know? How does it know that it's num? Because zero. Zero is a number. Right? So, uh, uh, how does it know it's bool? Well, because true and false are bool. So, it, it can figure it out. Now, here's this, uh, uh, an implementation in, in C++ of, of a similar, well, a different predicate is pointer. Okay? And again, it's inverted. This is the specialization. This is the general case. So in, in, in general, uh, t is not a pointer. So it returns false. Okay? Returns by having a static const, this time boolean value, false. But there is a specialization that's parameterized by some class type u. Yeah for u being a pointer. When, when it matches this pattern, u star, it's a pointer, and the specialization then returns true. Okay? And here you have pattern matching. Uh, uh, pattern matching in C++ and in Haskell, they, wor they work pretty similar. Okay? Okay, lists. Uh, in every functional language, uh, you have functions and you have lists. Lists are the basic data type. Everything else can be built out f from lists. Um, so, uh, let's say we want to define a function uh, that counts the number of elements in a list. Very simple, right? Now, we define the basic case for an empty list. So these, these two brackets, that looks like a rectangle, these are just two brackets, um, that's a, an empty list. The pattern is empty list, when, when it's empty, the count is zero, right? Otherwise, I can match this pattern head, tail. This is a cons in, in Haskell. Every list is either empty or is this constructed from its head, and another list, which we call tail. So, I mean, I can put any uh, identifier there. I just call it tail in this case, because that expresses what I want. So, I'm matching this pattern, head, tail. Okay, so when I'm given a list, it will be split into head and tail. And now I can operate on this head separately on the tail separately. So, so I say this is okay, one for the head and just count the tail and add these two together, right? And the type signature is, uh, yeah, a list of t. Why is, it a, uh, why is t a num? Because I have one plus. Okay, so it figured out, okay, count must be returning a t, so it must be a list of, of, type, of t. It's not true, but num restriction is on t1. Pardon? Oh, no, there, sorry, yes, 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 sorry, <laughs> exactly. Num restriction is on the return value, because I have one plus, I'm returning one plus, so it must be a num. Yeah, t is arbitrary, so I can have a list of 
characters, list of strings, list of anything. Thank you. Uh, same thing, really, really the same thing in C++ when you have variadic templates. Okay? And this time, um, I don't have a gen general case uh, because I either have an empty list or I have to match the uh, complex pattern tail head, he head and tail. So I don't have a general case, so I have to do a, f um, um, a declaration up front. So I'm just declaring that count is a struct, it's a template that takes a variadic number, variadic argument. So it can take 0, 1, 2, any number of arguments that are types because I put class here. So they are types. I could put type name there, but it's more typing. <clears throat> so once I have a, f uh, a forward declaration, I can put these specializations in any order. So I will pick the Haskell order. So, so, so you see uh, the correspondence. This is an empty list. So count of empty equals zero. Right? Same code, essentially, except for the black stuff, which you, you are supposed to be blind to by now. Um, and this is head and tail. Uh, okay? So, so pattern matching in C++. Compile time pattern matching. It works. Okay? If you have a variable number of parameters, you can match this variable number of parameters into two entities. One of them is class head, so it's a type that's the head of, the, of this list. And the rest you pack into what is called template parameter pack. So tail is a template parameter pack. This class dot 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 means take whatever is there, pack it into a template parameter pack. And there are very few things that you can do with a template parameter pack. Um, and uh, it's probably only one thing, right? Is you can expand it. Get its size. Get its size, okay, yeah. yeah. True. <coughs> yes? So the, the mapping you have here is <coughs> looks a little bit odd to me because the Haskell function takes a single argument that is a list and in this one it seems like you should have wrapped the count in you know count of list of head into a type dot list dot so that it took just one argument <coughs> yes it's not a perfect match in this sense it would yeah. be usable in the same context right so for me, a list in template metaprogramming is... Uh, no, it's not a parameter pack, because the parameter pack is used to match it, right? Okay. But it's, it's a variable number of types. Variable number of arguments for me is a list of arguments. Okay, and you wouldn't put, a, you wouldn't put a, something around it, like an a empty struct called list, that has the... to distinguish it as a mm -hmm. single logical object? I mean... I wouldn't. But, but I know there is an approach in which you actually define something which is, which is a type list, right? So, mm. yeah, what I mean is if you don't have that, then you can't pass a list and something else following it to a function. True. True. It has to be the last thing on the... Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, definitely there's a limitation here. Right. Um... Okay, so, so, uh, so I'm matching head and tail, right? And inside the function, so again, it's one, it returns one, plus recursively calls itself, okay? But now tail is a template parameter pack. It's, it's not a type. It's not a list of types. It's, it's an opaque object. This is how C++ defines it. It's, 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 it's not a type, it's not a variable, it's, it's, I don't know what to call it. I call it template parameter path. The only thing you can do it is you, you can expand it. And when you expand it, it becomes a variable number of types. Okay? So, 
Example, when I'm calling count on uh, three arguments, int, char, long, it should return three, right? So, first, this match. Okay, so head becomes int, tail becomes an opaque object that internally has char and long, okay? So now I'm calling, I'm, I'm using this, so I say one plus, and I'm calling count with what? I take this opaque object that in, inside has char and long, and I expand it. So af after tail, putting three dots after tail means expand it. Okay, so it expands into char and long. So I'm calling count with char and long variable number of parameters, this time two parameters. Okay? When I call it, you know, this is again split into head, which is char, and into a tail, which is just a one element template parameter pack, which obscures the, the long inside, and so on. Until I, I have a, an empty list and it matches this specialization. Okay, higher order functions. This is like the meat of functional programming. That functions can be used both as arguments to other functions and they can be returned from other functions. Okay? So, um, this is a nice example, or combinator. Um, you, you take two functions that, that are predicates and you just want to combine them into one function that's a predicate. Right? So, how do I define it? Um, okay, so, so our combinator has to return a predicate, so it has to return a function, right? A predicate is a function that returns a bool. So, in order to return a function, I, I have to create a lambda, right? And in Haskell, you just create a lambda. You say lambda of x, and this is the syntax. Okay? Uh, when you're typing on a regular keyboard, instead of lambda, you put a backslash, which is like a lambda with only one leg. <laughs> right? <laughs> so, so this is definition of this lambda. It takes an x and returns f1 acting on x, because f1 is a predicate, or f2 acting on x. Okay? Now, if you asking me if there is short circuiting in, in Haskell, yes, there is short short circuiting in everything Haskell does because Haskell will never calculate anything that it doesn't need immediately. Lazy, lazy, lazy. Very lazy. Yes. <clears throat> so if I combine like these two predicates, is zero and is one, which you can figure out how it's implemented easily, right? I will get a new predicate that is sort of is zero or one, right? And when I act, it, act on two, um, I'll get um, false, right? Because it's neither zero nor one. Uh, I don't really have to put these parentheses there, but I just put them for clarity. Okay, so or combinator in C++, very easy, right? Uh, so you take, uh, so I have to pass functions here, right? So here I will have to pass meta functions, right? So what are meta functions? Meta functions are template, template parameters. So I'm passing a meta function f1, which is a meta function that takes some type, right? And, and another meta function called f2, which is a meta function, so it's a template that takes something and returns something else, right? So these are my meta functions as argument to another meta function. Now what I have to return from this OR combinator is again a meta function, right? So how do you return a meta function? Well, it, uh, it just has to have a member that has a, some special name, which I just call lambda. I don't know. Is there is there a, a way of returning a meta function? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, if you take the the MPL model, we we stuff everything into types. Mm -hmm. 
you you pass meta functions as types as opposed to as templates. And, oh, I see. And you do the stuffing. Okay. And then we mm. return mm -hmm. them as types. Also. Okay. So I I went really close to the to Haskell in 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 here. Okay. Um, so I'm passing met, um, template template arguments and I want to return a template and returning a template means it has to have a member uh, with with some special name I call this name I, I call this lambda so if you want to access this this meta function that's returned by this you just say colon colon lambda and and that that's a meta function you couldn't chain this then to another or combinator yes you yes can. yes yeah yeah, because what this thing, re yeah, it's a it's a class. If I put double call, if I have an, uh, an or combinator, and I say colon colon uh, colon colon lambda, then this is this becomes a template template. I can pass it to another or, and so on. Yeah. What what if you wanted to work it with any RIT of functions because it's fixed to RIT of one. You can make a variadic template that will take. Can you take a variadic template class as a template parameter? I think so. I haven't studied, but 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 yeah. Why why not? Uh -huh. If not in this version of C++, maybe the next one. No, but I think it's it's in this version. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so so I define a lambda, so it's a template of some t, right? So this t corresponds to my x here. Okay, my lambda takes x, this lambda take, takes t, and what it does uh, with this t, it calls the meta function f1 with this t, calls meta function f2 with this t, extracts the value, that will be the boolean, right? and returns it. So if I, I can apply or combinator to let's say is PTR and is const which is very easy to define. I extract the lambda from there and then I call it with let's say const int as my type. So t becomes const int. And I extract the value which is the boolean. In this case it is const it's not a pointer, but it's const, so it, re it will return true. Yes? Uh, in our slide, uh, uh, the parentheses in the blue line, are they required? Oh, I didn't, I didn't say about the blue line. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, thank you for, for asking that. Yeah, this is the type of the or combinator. So or combinator, this is... This is um, this is a function that takes two arguments, right? In Haskell, a function that takes two arguments is really a function that takes one argument and returns a function that takes the second argument and then returns something. So, so you just chain it. So the first argument is a function that takes t and returns bool, okay? And I have to put it in parentheses, okay? Uh, the second argument is also a predicate t to bool and the result which is like when you have chain of these arrows the last one is your, is the result of the function that's how you interpret it yeah you can either interpret it as a function of multiple arguments or you can interpret it as, as a function of one argument that returns a function that takes another and so on okay it's called currying We'll see more of these, these weird types later, so yeah, let's get acquainted with them. Um, higher order functions on lists. So, uh, so here's, here's a, 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 met a function called all. It takes a predicate and a list. And it just applies this predicate to every element of the list, right? and uh, finds if all elements of the list satisfy this predicate. If any of them doesn't, then it returns and says false, right? So, uh, since it's acting on a list, right, I have to pattern match the list. It's either empty, the first case, or I split it into head and tail, right? 
Uh, so if it's head and tail, I, I apply the predicate to head and end it with uh, a recursive call, right? And I can then call this function all with a predicate is zero and the list zero, zero, one, and it will return false, obviously, right? So the same thing in uh, C++. Why is the empty list for return true? Because it's uh, satisfied in vacuum, right? Mathematically speaking, an empty list satisfies ev an any predicate. All elements of the list do satisfy it. There just aren't any such elements. Yeah. All of them, <laughs> exactly. Okay, I get it. Uh -huh. yeah, I get it. All zero of them. <laughs> Everything that's in there. Uh -huh. If there were something, it's a zero. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay, so so in order to do this in C++, I, uh, since it's a list, I have to start with a declaration up front. So I'm declaring uh, uh -huh. a template that takes a predicate, mm -hmm. the template template parameter, and a list. Okay. And now I, I go to specializations. So the first specialization will be for an empty list. Uh, it still takes a predicate, right? But the list is empty. There's no, nothing after the predicate. So it will return true, just like in Haskell. You see the red code? Same as in Haskell. And of course there's another page of it. I mean in Haskell it's written in a few lines, but here you have the page. So I will keep the Haskell definition here so that we see. So this is the specialization when the list is non-empty, so it splits it into head and tail, right? And it calls itself, it applies the predicate to head, ends it with recursive call to all predicate tail. Simple. Yes? Just want to point something out that unintuitively the C here is not lazy. So it will instantiate and evaluate predicate for every type in the list. Ah. Okay. And to make it you can make it lazy, but it requires making it uglier yeah. mechanics. Yeah. It's true, actually. You know, I mean this this code that's so close to Haskell is not that ugly. You can make it uglier and, and actually get more into the functionality of Haskell, but not to its syntax, right? So I can either make it not beautiful, I wouldn't call this code beautiful, but <laughs> sort of, you know, better, nicer. But you can make it ugly and then you can have fun the functionality of Haskell. Okay, list comprehension, right? I don't know if anybody's seen list comprehension in C++? Yeah? Okay. <coughs> okay, list comprehension is just sugar in, in, in Haskell. I mean, you don't need to do it because you can do it with functions. Okay, but it's a nice, uh, nice way and it's based on mathematical notation for sets. Where you say, I, I want to construct a set of elements such that. Okay, so here I'm constructing a set of elements that are squares, x times x. Uh, where do I take x from? Yeah. x is taken from a list 3, 4, 5. Ah, it's, that's the 45 minute. Uh -huh. How much slides do I have still? No, not that many. So either we take a 5 minute break here, Go to the end of your slides. Yeah? Yeah, we're, we're all... Okay, so, so list comprehension. Um, using list comprehension, I can, for instance, implement count in a, in a slightly different way. Uh, I just take a list and use this to generate all the elements. So x is an element of list. So it goes through all the, so it's like, a, like an iterator, goes through all the elements of, of a list and for each element of lists, uh, of the list it outputs one. So it transforms a list of whatever into a list of ones. 
right? And then I apply sum to it. Sum is a function that, that will just sum the elements of the list if they are numbers, right? So, yeah. And this is a different, slightly different implementation that I, I wanted to show because, because this translates easier to C++. Instead of putting one explicitly here, uh, I'm applying a function called one. A function called one just returns one for any argument, right? So, so, uh, so I'm, I'm expanding the list of x's, right? And for every x I call the function one, which produces number one. So it's the same code except that it uses a function instead of. So in template metaprogramming, and, and this is amazing because it fits here. There's no second page to this. Okay, so this is like coming as close to Haskell as, as possible. Uh, so function one, right, it just returns one. It's a meta function, it returns one. Okay. Mm. And now I have this um, count that takes a list. And I don't match this list this time. I don't pattern match it. Could be empty, could be anything. I don't care. I don't have to ma pattern match it. What I do is I do this. I do pattern expansion. This is very special syntax. You see the three dots here are not after a list. So I, if I put three dots after list, that would mean, okay, so expand this list, which is a pack, into a variable number of, of types. And I would call one with a variable number of types, I would get an error. Okay? So that's not it. What it is, is that this whole thing here, before the three dots, is, is, is a pattern. And list becomes a placeholder for the elements of the list. And when I apply the three dots here, these elements pop here, one by one. So I will have one of the first element, then I have a one of the second element, one of the third element, and so on. And this will create me a new list that I will pass to sum. Okay? Sum is a, is a meta function that takes a list of integers and just sums them up. <coughs> so this is, a, this is a very, very terse meta function, which uh, I am proud of. So here's this pattern expansion explained a little bit more. But actually, I, I, think, I think I did already a good job of explaining it. Say no if, if I didn't. <laughs> okay? How do you put guards on the on the um, this comprehension? Oh, <laughs> guards. I know guards. How do you put guards on this comprehension? Uh, I don't think you can do it with that one. I don't think so. Yeah. I was just so happy that I can do anything like this <laughs> in C++ that I thought, oh my gosh. You know? <laughs> okay, um, and, and like one of the workhorses of, of uh, functional programming is, is this function map that, uh, that you might know from uh, C++ is transform. Right? It takes a list and applies a function to every element of this list and returns a new list. Now this, you would think, okay, well, that should be easy, right? It takes a function to be applied to every element of a list, right? So why don't I just take a pattern, f of list, and three dots, right? It will expand list to each element separately and create a list this doesn't work though. I, I put typedef here in, in quotations because I don't know what to put here. Because um, you cannot return a template parameter pack. And you cannot expand it and then return it because you cannot return a, a multiple list of multiple types. So this does not work. It's sad, huh? Your, your list of a bunch of arguments.
minutes and put a wrap around it. Yes. Yeah. You. you yeah. You, you. 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 Yeah. You can do it with um, uh, type list, right? Essentially, type list. Well, it doesn't have to be doesn't have to be a const structure anymore, right? Mm -hmm. it can just be a struct with a variable number of parameters. Yeah. Okay, but, but even this, I can rescue this, okay? <laughs> Using a, another mechanism that's, that's uh, uh, used in functional languages called continuation. Yeah, because, okay, I cannot return this new list. I can construct this new list. I have syntax to constructing this new list using list comprehension, but I cannot return it, but I can pass it, right? So I can put three dots after it, and I can pass it to some other meta function, right? So why don't I have a map with continuation, which takes three arguments. It, take, it takes the function that I'm applying, the list, and a continuation. A continuation is a function that is to be applied to my list, to, to my result list. Okay, and I think this is a pretty important thing to understand. Uh, <clears throat> so, so let me explain it really carefully. So, first the implementation of map cont in Haskell, right? So it takes these three arguments <coughs> and it applies the continuation to my result list. And my result list is done using list comprehension. So I take all elements of my list and shove them into F. So I apply F to the first element, second element, third element, and I get a new list. And with this new list, I call my continuation. And my continuation is a function that takes a list <coughs> and returns some arbitrary type. Okay? So look at the signature of this. This is very important. Uh, the blue uh, line at the top shows me that map cont takes three arguments and returns some type T2. Okay, the first argument is, the, is my continuation. It's a function that takes a list of some T1 and returns T2. Because the result of map cont is whatever my continuation returned, right? So if my continuation returns some type T2, that's what my whole map count returns, T2. Okay? So this is the continuation parameter. The second is the function that takes T and returns T1. And the third one is my list. And I can translate it word for word into C++. Right? So I have continuation, okay, that's a meta function. Mm -hmm. I have function f that I'm going to apply to this list. Okay? And look how terse it is. <laughs> <laughs> so, so as before, as I showed you in this previous one, I take this pattern f of list, colon, colon, type, that's my pattern, and I put three dots after it. So this placeholder LST will be replaced by all the elements of, of list, one by one. And this will create a list of types, right? And this list of types I pass to my continuation, okay? Continuation is a variadic template now. So it accepts this list and, and then I extract the value from this meta function continuation and that's my return value. Okay? So the use of continuations is, is, is pretty important and, and I will use them in, in the second part of my talk. So that's, that's why I wanted to, uh, you to, to understand this. Okay, this bibliography. So you, you can look it up on, on the internet. When, when these, these slides are available. So let's take a, a, a five minute break. Uh, does it make sense? It doesn't make sense, right? How much time do I have? Half an hour? Um, 
Uh, four o'clock was the afternoon break, 4 p.m. Ah, okay. Um, For half an hour. But, but you probably have to change the tape, right? Okay. Um, um, okay, but I have half an hour. Okay, so you, you're just telling me when, when to change the table. So, so I'll, I'll start the, the, the second part. Okay, questions? I don't think I understand what continuation do in your uh, C++ template program part. Okay, a continuation is, is used in this way. Uh, my function calculates something. And I don't want to return this something but I want to continue my calculations with this something as an argument. So continuation is just like the rest of my calculation. So do some calculation for me and then call the continuation. Just say, do the rest of the calculation with this value that I have just calculated. It's just a different way of... of um, implementing computations. One is you, you call a function, it returns a value. With this value, you do the rest of, of computation. Right? And here is you call a function that calculates this value and then calls the function that corresponds to the rest of the calculation. Okay? Yes? It, it almost seems like you're uh, you're turning your list into like uh, a series of function calls with uh, like an, a, one element of the list as as one argument, and then the rest of the list is another. Sort of like with the head and tail from SQL. But not when I'm doing it with list comprehension. You see, with list comprehension, I don't split it into head and tail. I'm just saying, whatever the list is, apply this function to every element of the list, and that creates a new list. Transform. Transform my list using this function. Right? So it transforms the list using this function, but what it gets back is it's this template parameter pack, or, or, or actually a variadic uh, list, and I cannot return it. So I'm forced to, to just say, okay, I cannot return it, but I can pass it further. So I'm going to pass it to the rest of the calculation instead of returning it. I'm saying, take the rest of the, of the computations that you wanted to do with this value, right? And just pass it to me as a function. That's the, I will call continuation. Just encapsulate all this rest of stuff that you want to do, encapsulate into a function, pass it to me, and I'll call it for you. Can you show the code again, please? Yeah. <coughs> okay. This was like the one of the last slides. Okay, this one. So here, do this calculation for me. You get a list. Pass this list to continuation and I do the rest. Instead of doing Calculate this list, return it. And then, with this returned argument, continue. Do the rest of the calculations in your program. Whatever you are doing in your program, whatever is, you know, what you do with this list. Yes? Is it common syntax in Haskell to have this kind of things? Uh, Continuations like this? Well, this is, this is nothing special. Continuation is just a function. I'm just calling a function with a function. I don't need to. No, no. In, in Haskell, I don't need to. No. It's because you have to in C++. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I'm using this trick. In Haskell, I can do it this way or that way. You know, it's equivalent. 
in C++ I can't. Okay, so let me start you on the second part, which is about monads. Anybody knows about monads? <laughs> okay, a little bit. Okay, okay. So you guys will help me, huh? <laughs> no. Actually, you know, I, 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 this morning I, I, I thought I, I will go through these slides just, just to remind myself. And I said, I look at it and I, gosh, even I don't understand this stuff. Okay? But in the morning my, my brain is kind of slow. Uh, so I went uh, during the lunch break, I added a few pictures. Okay, and I think with these pictures, monads will finally be very easy to understand. That's my hope. Start. Go ahead, please. Okay, so monads um, is something that even many Haskell programmers don't get, at least the beginners. It's like the, the major block that people get about monads. So. It will be really hard to explain it, but um, why, why do I even talk about monads? Because I, um, I knew a little bit about monads in Haskell and, and thought, okay, neat, neat, you know, I'm not using Haskell much, so who cares? Uh, but then I started studying Proto. Eric tried to explain to me the stuff that they did in Proto. and. Um, and I thought, okay, so I know Haskell a little bit, right? I, I'm just going to explain this thing to myself using Haskell, right? Uh, didn't work, okay? Because Pro, what Proto does, it, it does uh, a bunch of calculations at compile time and then it has this runtime thing. So whatever it produces is actually a, an object but it's run at runtime. So there's uh, like two different worlds. I mean, I know how to do stuff in compile time using Haskell, more or less, right? Uh, I, and, but I don't know how to, to add to it this, the second world of, of runtime, right? And, and then it occurred to me, gosh, this is like a state monad which is also has a very similar structure that you just do stuff, compose things. It's not compile time, but, but it's like a separate area of your program where you, you keep composing stuff. And at the end you get something, you return a function, and then you run this function with state. In this case, in, in the case of, of Proto, the state was, was these X and Y and Z, these arguments that you pass to your lambda, right? So that's the state. And I thought, no, that won't work. But I tried, I tried, I tried, and finally I taught myself enough monads that I could translate it into C++. So monads uh, are used in Haskell. Uh, to, as a solution to several programming challenges. Because the things that are so easy for us in C++, in functional languages are really, really hard. Because they involve things like state, like uh, modifying variables, uh, and, and things like these. So the, the most Functional languages, be before Haskell, they would just give up and say, okay, this is the functional core of the language, okay? And here, if you really want to do some real stuff, okay? This is a non-functional thing here in the corner, okay? So do most of your stuff functional, and, but then if you really need to like do input, output, stuff like this, okay, then here's the little closet with secrets. You could just use them. And the Haskell guys said, no, we have to do it functionally. We have to prove the world that functionally you can do everything. Everything you can do, guys, we can do and better. <laughs> right? <laughs> so they had to deal with st stuff like exceptions, like state, side effects, 
and of course I/O, input output. And then there's this other stuff, you know, the the, the proto and uh, mixed compile time runtime programming. That's my uh, personal motivation. So here's the plan. I'll talk about computations versus functions because what we do in uh, imperative programming is actually called computations and, and they, are, they are not functions. Then I will give you a pretty much trivial example of the maybe monad but it shows you the, the mechanics of, of monads. It's not that useful in itself. It's useful in Haskell, but probably you wouldn't really want to use it in, in C++ because in C++ you have something better. Uh, well, better. Okay. Um, then I'll talk about uh, bind, which is how do you compose these things that are uh, monadic functions. Monadic functions correspond to, to these computations that are not functions. You turn them into monadic functions. Okay. Uh, return, that's a function that will need explanation, and the do notation, which is the syntactic sugar that makes Haskell look like imperative programs. Mm -hmm. Can I make a suggestion, just because you're running short of time, that you just dive in instead of telling us what you're about to tell us? Mm -hmm. I think everybody's ready to All right. see what it is you have to say. Okay. <laughs> Teaser? <laughs> no, we are. <laughs> Teaser. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> computations versus functions. Uh, a lot of computations are, can be expressed as functions easily. Just t give me an argument, I'll calculate something, return the value. <coughs> right? And every time you call me with this argument, I'll return the same value. That's the definition of function. Lots of computations are like this. And then a lot of computations are not like this. For instance, there are computations that are not defined for all possible arguments. For some arguments that I say, they, they just say, no, I cannot. They, for instance, they, they return errors or throw exceptions. A function has to be defined for all its val uh, arguments. There are non-deterministic ones that return many things, an alternative of things. That are, that are, there are computations that have side effects and state, so if you call it once, it will return a different value than when you call it second time, because it changed state internally, something, it doesn't show as a, the function has to return the same thing, here it doesn't. And of course input-output, if you, if you call get char multiple times, Right? It will return, usually return different chars. Right? So it's not a function. Right? Get char is not a function. I mean, it's something new to C++ programmers, probably, but the Haskell programmers will always tell you that. So, what it turns out is that in order to take these computations that are not functions and put them into functional language, you turn them into functions that return not the original type that your computation was supposed to return, but they return an enriched type. So they just put more stuff into it. Okay? So, uh, like the enriched types for the first case, when, when, you are, when you have errors or exceptions, they, they return this maybe values. So it's like, whatever was the computation was returning, I will return two, except that I'll have one more bit saying, uh, is it valid or not? Right? These will be the most interesting for, for, for us, the state uh, changing things, because they return actions. And I'm not going to tell you now, because I'm, go I'm going to explain it uh, fully. Okay, foundation of this stuff is category theory. And I I'm just mentioning it. Okay, uh, every monad consists of three components, and we'll be talking about these components. One is type constructor. This is how to get, take a regular type, right, and enrich it. Right? Um, 
the bind, which is the composition of, of, of these monadic functions. How to compose these new, func new, new functions that correspond to computations. How to, you know, call this one function and then call the next function with the result of the previous one. If the result of the previous one is this enriched type, right, so I have to like, exp you know, take out the value that's inside this enriched type and call it the next function. And, so on. and then there's the third component it's called return and it has nothing to do with uh, C++ return, it's a function and it just takes, uh, it does for types, uh, for values what, uh, what the type constructor does for types. So it just encapsulates a value into this enriched type. So this is the example of the maybe monad, this is the simplest well, it's not the simplest, I mean, this is, there is a trivial empty monad, but maybe monad is like the, the simplest monad that does something. And here's the motivation in C++. Okay, you have this function method find on strings, right? It, it finds an, a character in a string, okay, and it returns the offset of this character inside a string. And you just want to use it to extract the extension of a file name. So you look for a dot, and then you extract the substring starting from this offset where you found the dot, and the length, appropriate length. And it works in most of the cases, right? When, when you, mo most files actually have extension, in, at least in, in Windows. But if it doesn't have an extension, this is a disaster, right? Because it returns an offset that is totally invalid. It, it returns like, the, you know, unsigned minus one, which is infinity. So when you call substring with infinity, you just get a fault, right? The program dies a horrible death. And the compiler would, will not tell you that something is wrong with this code because the special value of error is of the same type as the normal value. It's an unsigned, right? So how is this thing done in Haskell? So here you have a function that uh, is not defined for all values. So, so this function uh, find is not defined very well for strings that don't have a dot in them, right? So for some strings it's just not very well defined. <coughs> so you take this computation that we are doing here and instead of returning an offset it will return an enriched type called maybe. And this enriched type has an additional bit. So it has this unsigned integer, which it normally returns, plus a bit that says valid, not valid, right? And if it returns this, this enriched type, you can't just pass this enriched type to substring. The substring doesn't understand what the maybe is, right? It only understands integer. So there is a barrier between these two that forces you to do something. Okay? Because just the composing of these two things that I do here, you know, one function returns offset, I use this offset to call the next function. This composition will not work straightforwardly. So in Haskell, you define a new data type called maybe, uh, and you can define this data type for an arbitrary starting type. So you can say maybe of integer or maybe of string. It's okay. just a parameterized type. Like it's just a parameterized type, right, right. So A is the type parameter here. They call it A or T, uh, lowercase, in, in Haskell. And this is the data definition. <coughs> and uh, it just says there are two constructors of this maybe object. One constructor is called nothing, and the other constructor is called just, and this constructor takes a type, t takes a value of type A. Okay? Um, in C++, you would say this is a tagged union. 
right? Boost optional. Boost optional, thank you. Boost optional is maybe. Optional is probably taken from, from uh, ML, something like that, yeah. So let's talk a little bit more about data types in Haskell. <clears throat> because unlike data types, uh, data in, in uh, imperative languages, data in Haskell is not mutable ever. You never mutate anything. So since you don't mutate your data, your data remembers how it was created and with, with what arguments. So if you created a maybe using the uh, constructor nothing, it will remember that it was constructed as nothing. If you created it using just and passed the value, let's say seven, just seven, it will remember that it was created with just, so it will have a tag just, right, and a value stored of seven. Is this a, is this a side effect of laziness, where, where the data is actually the expression that creates it? No, no it's just no. a tag. No. All right. It's just, okay. a, just, just a tag, right. yeah. So in order to ask, you, so, so you get a piece of data from some other part of your program, okay? How do you know how it was created? You have to ask it, you know, how, how were you created? Were you created as nothing or as just? And if just, then what was the original value? And this you do using pattern matching. So you say, do you match this pattern or do you match the other pattern? And if Okay, and, and the matching is, is, is uh, it can either be done as we did pattern matching in defining functions, like you, mul you, you, uh, you define multi multiple definitions of the same function using different patterns. You can, you can do it inside a function using case of. So you have some value m, which is of type maybe, and you say case of match this maybe that I get here with different constructors, different possible constructors. So where you created as nothing, if so, then return this expression. If not, maybe you were created with just x. Okay, if you were created with just x, then return this expression. And here I can use the x. It matched, it matched the tag and it matched the value. So this m contained some value inside and it was matched with, with the name x. So here I'm, I'm uh, defining a, a function show maybe. It takes a maybe, right? And it prints it. Oh, it actually turns it into a string, okay? We don't do IO yet. Uh, <clears throat> So, so it returns a string nothing in this case, and in this case it returns a string something concatenated with function show takes an x and turns it into a string. So it's like uh, in Java you have two string, every object has a two string method. In Haskell you have the show function that takes a type and shows it, turns it into a string. It's not defined for all types, of course but it's defined for a certain type class of show. Okay, so here's an example. I create x as nothing, and I show, show maybe x. It prints nothing, right? I, I, I set, set y to just 15, and show maybe will say something 15. This is how it works. So this is pattern matching. I have a question. Yes? Is nothing a type or what is the nothing? Uh, okay, it, first of all it's a type constructor. This is something, it's like a constructor in C++ more or less. It constructs the type maybe with the tag no, nothing and no value stored. So we can view the maybe as a union between the nothing and the just a? So it's a tagged union. Tagged union. Yeah, it's a tagged union. This is how we implement it in C++. Which is right here, okay? So I define a tag. 
So this is probably how optional, optional probably is more complicated than this, right? But, but, but this is like a simplified optional, right? You have a tag with two values, it's an enumeration, nothing or just. And your maybe, the type constructor for maybe, you know, take any type T and define a new type that contains a value of type T but this value is only valid if the tag here is just. So if you are using a maybe, you have to look at the tag. If the tag is just, then you can extract the value. Otherwise, don't do that. Okay? You're not really protected from this by any magic, like in Haskell, but here uh, in, in C++ you just have to do this. So, so if I define a function safe find, and instead of returning an offset, it returns a maybe offset, right? Maybe size D. Then I cannot pass this offset directly to substring because substring does not understand maybe. So what I do is I check the tag for just. If it's just, then I can extract off dot value. And here also off dot value. Right? And this is, this is safer code. Of course, nobody makes me do this. In Haskell, you have to do this. In, in C++, it just reminds you that maybe you should do this because you have a maybe. Yes? If you use boost variant to implement this, you would have to deal with both cases. <sighs> yeah, okay, okay. Makes sense. It's just that in the other case, I do nothing here. How come? Why? Why you? Why have you moved into runtime now? I mean, this example is evaluated at runtime. Yes. Well, yes. Yes. Yeah. I, I'm just <coughs> for 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 the purpose of explanation. Yeah. Afterwards, I'll, I'll be doing it in comp at compile time. But this is just showing you. You know, this is this is what Haskell does. This is how you can translate it into runtime C++. So that you understand the code. So, so there is a, a composition of functions. Okay. So, so suppose that I have two functions that are of, the, of this new special thing that they return maybes. Okay. So I have a function that returns a maybe and a function f. I have another function g that also returns maybe. I have function a that returns a maybe. Okay? Uh, all these functions take some values, not maybes. I want to, com I want to uh, ex execute them one after another, right? So I have to put something between the execution of the first function and the second function that does the checking, right? Error checking. That's, that's, that's what you do. You do error checking after every function, right? The extraction of the value. And the extraction of the value. Okay, so both things you have to do. So in order to compose functions of this new enriched type, we'll call them monadic functions, functions that return this enriched type, okay, I have to do some bookkeeping. The black code is the bookkeeping. The red code is what's interesting in this function. So, you have a function f of x, it returns a y, call g with this y, it returns a v, call h with this y, a v, and returns z, and then finally returns z. Right? This is sort of how you look at this. Plus, you have all this structure around these things that does the error checking. The ugly stuff. And, and you see what, what the um, proportion is between black and red here? Okay, bookkeeping. A lot of it. But if you want to have a correct program, you have to do this. So, function f of x returns y. Check the tag of y. If it's just, then I can extract value from y, called g. It returns another maybe, and so on. Okay? And the important point is that if, if, if any of them returns nothing, right? If, if f returns nothing, I don't get into this if at all. Right? That's the end for me. In fact, I should have here returned something. Oh, okay. It's not a complete example. It's pseudocode. 
<laughs> so ideally, I would like to have code like this, right? I'm calling f returns y, calling g with y returns b, calling h, and then returns z. That, that would be ideal, because now I have only the relevant code, no bookkeeping. So this magic b here would just do the bookkeeping for me. And the question is, can I do this? in C++, can I do this in Haskell and still have the safety of, of this code? And the answer in both languages is yes. And it's as simple in, in either language. <coughs> so let's go back to Haskell and see about this composition, right? So we, we want to, ha we now have these functions that return maybes, okay? These, these enriched type maybe. And we want to compose them. So I showed you the composition in C++. It requires checking, and then here in, in Haskell it requires pattern matching. Is it nothing? Is it just, right? And if it's just, that we do the rest of the stuff. In Haskell, people think like this. Okay, here's a pattern, right? Every pattern can be expressed as a function, really. You just have to go one abstraction level above it, you know? It's like one more indirection level in normal programming. In Haskell, it's one more abstraction level. Let's abstract this glue, this red code. Let's abstract it. It's a function. So what does this function do? Well, it takes m as an argument, right? It pattern matches it. If it finds nothing, it returns nothing. But if it finds just, then what does it do? It executes the rest of the code with this value from v1, the v1, from inside the just. Are you trying to say that it's a continuation? No. <laughs> no okay. I had a question. Uh -huh. Can you explain the second line, the black line, let m equals fm in? What does that mean? Okay, this is a let expression. Let defines a new name for something. So, like a variable, but it's not really variable because you don't mutate it. So, it says let m be equal to f acting on n, no parentheses in Haskell, this is f acting on n, and in says that this n will be defined in whatever follows. So whatever follows has m defined as the result of acting with f on n. So this is like a local variable, but in Haskell. Okay? So, the rest of the computation, hey, that's a continuation, right? It's like, so, so this, this uh, function that would encapsulate the red code would take one argument, which is this m, and the second argument, it could take a second argument that's the continuation. And what it does is, if, if m matches nothing, then return nothing. If it matches just, then extract the value from just and call this continuation. The rest of the calculation, right? And now this red code becomes a function and it's called bind. Okay? Here's my continuation as a lambda. So it's lambda of some v1, okay? And when it gets v1, it does the rest of the calculation with this v1. So it uses it here. Right? And then this code, of course, here I have a glue also, right? I have case m of this, this, and this, this. You do the same with, with this thing. Okay, this red stuff will be my bind, my function, and will take the continuation. It's a continuation within continuation within continuation. So here's the glue abstracted into a function bind. So the red code goes inside bind, and I call it with m, 
and I call it with a continuation. And the continuation here, it's just lambda that takes v1 and returns all the rest of the code. So I've transformed this code into this code. It's the same thing, okay? But ex instead of doing this, I'm just turning the rest of the code into a lambda. Call it my continuation and I pass it. This whole thing is an argument to bind. One argument, second argument. This whole thing. So, what is the order of evaluation in this case? Is f acting on, is, is f invoked first followed by g or followed by h or is the inverse? So, it's lazy. It's lazy, but when you do call it's, it... It's, it's, it's lazy, but, but this continuation cannot be evaluated until v1 is available, right? So, so yeah, it has to call f first, and then it has to call continuation because there is beta dependency between these two. So this is how you, uh, you do uh, things that require order in Haskell. You put beta dependency between them. Before I can do this, I have to calculate that because this depends on that, right? Yes? Stupid question, probably. Where is f? What is f, in fact? What, what is f? Where did we define f? Yeah. What is f? If f, f is just some monadic function that we define somewhere else. f, g, and h are just three functions that return maybes. Okay. Yeah, they return maybes. They take normal arguments, but they return maybes to, to, to just tell the world that they might fail. So I have a bunch of these functions that return maybes, and now I'm, 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 I want to chain them, right? I want to do some more complex calculation using the simpler calculations. This is like the basis of all programming, decomposition, right? Yeah, but so why did you make that function also a parameter to the compose? Uh, so if I compose f and f, then everything would be zero. Oh, oh. Uh, why didn't I make f, g, and h parameters? I could have, yeah. Or they could be just global functions. Okay. They often are global functions. You just define a bunch of functions and then you define the, compo the co composite w which uses these functions and so on. Okay, I cannot stop right now because if you lose the track of, of what I'm saying, uh, I'll lose you. I'm afraid, right? So let me let me just do the bind thing. So bind monadic bind. Now this this is this was a very special pattern for maybe, but this is totally general thing that you do with monads. Okay. So <clears throat> so let me just like make sure that you understand this. So a bind, this monadic bind, takes a maybe in this case. So it takes this enriched type, right? It takes a continuation. And what does it return? It returns another maybe, right? In particular, if the first function, uh, if, if, the, if the argument is nothing, that it will return nothing, right? So that's the, that's the fallback case, you turn nothing. If it doesn't fail, it will return just something. So bind returns this enriched type, maybe. And here's the definition of bind. And also look, look at the type signature, okay? So this is translated from, from what I said there. It takes a maybe of type A, takes a continuation that takes A, this type, okay, and returns maybe of some other type B. Doesn't have to be the same type. I mean, this, this is a computation that takes an integer and returns a string. It will be turned into a function that takes an integer and returns a maybe string, right? So this is maybe of B, the second argument, and bind returns another maybe, and it's a maybe of this B. So 
So here's the definition of my bind function. M is the maybe, F is the continuation. Case M of, if M is nothing, then return nothing. If it's just V, then call my continuation with V. Done. <coughs> There's a compact form of this. But, yes? It looks like it would be equally useful to have a maybe where the continuation was only required to return a B and not a maybe B. It would be exactly the same signature except you'd take out that maybe in the middle. And I'm wondering if, <coughs> I, am I failing to recognize something? Is that maybe important? Well, no, bind, bind is, is used to combine monadic functions, so they have to return maybes. If, if, you, if you want to combine with a, with a regular function, then you don't use bind. You do use bind, but you have to lift the other function into them. So you have to return the other function, which kind of... You can... There's, there's basically, in yes. the monadic construct, there's a function that takes a function from A to B and turns it into a function from A to maybe B. So that you can use it in the... Okay, yeah. You, you're right. But I'm, I'm thinking of return as taking a value. Because it really takes... Something like lift, I think. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. But normally you would do it with return. Return the result of acting with F on something, right? You just lift the result. You don't have to lift the function. No, you lift the function because it's easier than all the time kind of doing a non monad embedding a non monadic expression, doing a let and then returning that. It's okay. You can well, do both. Yeah, that's a digression, though. So this is this cascade of continuous. This is very important to to sort of uh, picture your, in your in your mind. So I'm acting with f on v. It returns a, a monadic result, a, you know, the in, in enriched result. And if it's nothing, I just bypass everything, go to the exit. But if it's just, then I call this lambda. That's my continuation. And this internally, again, calls v1, and it returns this result. I match it. I can return immediately, or I can call another lambda, and so on. And in fact, in Haskell, because you put this sort of stuff in the middle of this, so it's like bind is actually between this and this, they use an infix notation for this. And this is what you can find. If you are looking at Haskell stuff, you'll find this infix operator left, right shift inputs. You don't have to know this. This is, uh, yeah. And this is the, this, the same uh, code that I wrote before, except that now it's using the infix notation for bind. So it binds this with the lambda, okay? And finally, the return function. This is a trivial thing in this case of maybe, uh, a, but a return function has to be defined in order to complete the monad. So first element of the monad, that was this type constructor that creates an enriched type. There is bind that uses to combine functions that return enriched types. Uh, and finally, there's return, which just takes a regular value and enriches it, okay? And in this case, enriching a value is just saying, okay, well, it's just V, right? Okay, let me see what's next. Oh, the do notation, uh, just for completeness, okay? This, this code is pretty ugly, even for, yeah. So, so there is a special sugar, syntactic sugar to, to yes? What is the type of compose? So there's a case when it, some type, when some function call returns nothing. What is the, that would be a different? What is then the return type of compose? It's maybe. So it's maybe or v3, which is not a maybe, or it has to be a maybe. No, v3 is not a maybe. 
return v3 is a maybe because that's what ah it okay out. because the magic mm -hmm. turn another yeah okay. yeah uh -huh. it enriches it <laughs> yeah mm -hmm. exactly man I'm gonna finish this and so the do notation is just syntactic sugar what is interesting about this is that it looks much more now like what we started with uh, this magic code right I, I told you this magic do after which you just write regular code and don't see the, the maybes, don't see the errors, nothing, you know. This is a special notation which, which accomplishes this. The whole plumbing of binding is hidden from you. Unfortunately, I won't be able to do this in C++. Yeah? So, this is specific to the bind that we just generated, right? What, what is specific to bind? So, the bind function object that we created a couple of slides back. Mm -hmm. um, how is, so this notation then tells me that it's, that bind, not, bind is some, uh, the, that bind is... Are you, are you asking about the notation? Uh, do notation works for every monad, and every monad defines bind. But, oh, so bind is special. Yeah, special. monad has type constructor, bind, and return. Okay, right. So do notation works for every monad. And this is C++ do notation, okay? Function compose calls f with v, it returns v1, calls g with v1, returns v2, and finally returns v3. Looks exactly like this, right? Oh, one-to-one -one correspondence. Except when you call compose, you do this thing, try catch, okay? So this whole thing is also implemented in C++ using exceptions. Okay, exceptions provide more functionality than, than maybe. Okay, but, but the principle is the same. In C++ you just do this with exception. You don't really need optional, you don't need uh, maybe, you just do exceptions, right? And this is your do notation in C++. The difference is you cannot generalize it. It only works for exceptions. The do notation in C++ only works for exceptions. There is no other monad in C++ that's built in. Plus, in Haskell, you have very strong type checking, which in C++ you could say, oh, the type checking will have to include the exception specification. Right? If we had exception specification, right, which I think was dropped, right? So, and because it didn't work really. So if we had exception specification and the compiler enforced it, then it would, it would be part of the type system. But it isn't. Okay, okay, am I done? Yeah, 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 this is a good point to stop. Okay. So you, you get some time for setting these ideas in your brain, maybe rearranging it a little bit. Um, because the, the next step is building on the previous stuff. But we'll be repeating the same ideas over and over, so they will maybe you understand them better every, on, on every iteration. Yes. Are we already recording? Okay. Are you recording? Yeah? Yes. Okay, good. Okay, so th this is the really, the really what I wanted to talk about, about the state monad. Maybe monad was just to illustrate in a simple example how you bind things, how you create these in, uh, enriched types, how you ter turn a computation into a function that returns enriched types. Okay, but state monad is really the one interesting. <coughs> so this monad is used to deal with computations that uh, use state. So for instance, they, they could be using global variables, they can modify them, they can, they can have static variables, and so on. So these are definitely not functions because they, they, they don't return the same value every time. Um, and it turns out that this kind of computation that deals with state 
can be modeled by a function. You can, you can turn it into a function, but you have to explicitly pass the state. You know, you ex encapsulate the state into an object, right? You just pass it to this function, it deals with the state, okay? And then it modifies the state and returns the modified state. Now that's perfectly functional, right? And if, if the computation was returning some particular value, you just uh, bind it with the new state. So it returns a, a, a people, right? New state and some value. <coughs> so this is, this is the simplest of these, these functions that you can think of. It actually doesn't take any arguments except state, right? And it returns a tuple state and some value of arbitrary type t, depending on what computation you were dealing with. Okay, so this is called an action. Okay, and we'll be talking about actions a lot. It takes a state, returns a tuple. Um, now, a computation is not really an action, because a computation w will take some additional arguments, right? I mean, you start with a computation that takes a bunch of arguments and returns a value and deals with state, right? Um, so this, is, this doesn't really fit in our monadic world, where, where, where you take a computation and you just change the return type into something. Here you, you, you not only change the return type, you also would have to pass the state up front together with other arguments. This is not that easily generalizable. <coughs> and, and composing such functions is also very manually doing this. It's all possible. So you take any computation that has state and you can turn it into, into a bunch of functions that take state, return state, plus all other arguments and all other values. You can do it manually, you can unpack stuff at the end, pack them back, and so on. So it's all possible, but it's messy. So ideally what we would like to do, and in Haskell they always strive for the ideal, Okay, and then, and then see, can it be done using functions? So we would like to hide the state. This is what we do originally in, in imperative programming, right? We just hide state. You have a function, the so-called function, right? It accesses state. We don't know that this function accesses state. Unless we look into the implementation, right? So it would be nice if we could sort of hide the state because... and... and, and um, but, but uh, at the same time, if we hide the state as, as we do in imperative programming, we lose the type safety, right? Because now you don't know that the type of the function doesn't tell you that it's using state, right? And what kind of state it's using. Is it modifying the state or not? Plus, <coughs> if you are in Haskell, you would like to have a sequencing of actions, right? So. You do the first action, it modifies the state, then you call the next thing with its modified state, right? It does its stuff, and, and so on. Now, if you hide the state, then suddenly you have functions that don't depend on the state, you don't see that. And if you say, do this function first, and this function second, and third function next, Haskell will say, ha, huh, I know better. I'll do the last function first, okay, then go to the first one, then do the middle one, and sometimes I won't do anything because nobody's using the result of this function. Because all it did is modify some hidden state, right? So these, these things, we want these things to be done, but on the other hand we won't have notation in which doesn't show this. And the solution is, is, is this. Separate two worlds. One is the composition of things. So, 
When you have multiple computations that deal with state and you want to do them one after another, what is combining of, of these things separately? And then when you are done with this combination, they will produce something which we call action. And then you call this action with your state and it, it will return you a new value and a new state. Yes? So, say you want to call the same function a million times from the state in sequence. Mm -hmm. you know, what happens then? Do you have to sequence, you have to have some sort of list where you have a million entries? Well, well in, in Haskell you, 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 you use it re recursion, right? So Instead of loops. You can put recursion into this? You can put recursion into this, yes. Yes. Yeah, you can call a recursive monadic function. Mm -hmm. what, if you don't, what if you don't know when it's going to terminate as well? For example, it terminates depending on some result. Um, No, the recursion will actually happen when you are executing the action. Recursion does not happen. The recursion will just be encoded into this action. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah. And the result of this is a statement. I think I have, I, yeah, I have the picture that I did during lunch. <laughs> because uh, this, this is maybe a little hard to understand. So, the starting point is computation. Computation takes a bunch of arguments, returns some value. Oh, that was type A. Okay, it disappeared. Okay, some, some value of some arbitrary type A. Right, uh, and and whilst doing this computation, it's it's accessing some state, possibly mutable state, possibly it mutates the state. Right, so there is this cloud here, the state. It comes into play somehow, not clear how. Okay, it depends on the implementation of this computation, and finally it produces a value. So this arrow here are the original arguments to the computation. Um, and, and it returns a value. Now we split it in this way. We turn this computation into a monadic function. This monadic function takes some arguments, the same arguments as, as the computation. But it returns an enriched thing called an action. It doesn't return a value it returns a function. And this is the action. The action that's returned by this, it takes a state and returns a value of type A plus it returns the modified state. So the state transformation is done here by the action. Whereas the implementation of your algorithm, implementation of your computation, is done here. It's like, here I'm, com I'm, I'm compiling a program to do this computation. The resulting program is this action. I run this action and I get my result. So this division here, splitting in the middle, is the state monad. And my goal is to turn this into C++ compile time computation and this into the runtime part of my computation. This is why I need monads. And this is what Proto does. Uh, why wouldn't this, why wouldn't most of the work that's actually done in the monadic function be done in the action itself. Is, so how do you s separate the parts? How do you decide which part goes in? The part that needs state has to be executed here. The part that doesn't need state can be done here. <coughs> yeah, so 
it's done by the programmer that, okay, I have to split it into these two halves. Right? It's not... No, actually, the thinking is different. The thinking is like this. You think about computation. This is what I'm going to do. Living state, okay? This computation is some algorithm. It calls some other functions and so on, right? You take this, you translate it in, into a monadic function. So this is how you get your monadic function. And this function will return an action, mm -hmm. and you run this action. So there is, there is a correspondence between these two. This is your concept that, that you are trying to implement. You implement it as a monadic function. I mean, you have to see examples, yeah. right? But this is the, 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 the main idea. <coughs> <clears throat> and actually, I won't be showing you the state monad because I don't have the time. Uh, so instead, I will, I will show you uh, an, um, an example of a simpler monad, which is called a reader monad, which deals with state exactly the same way, except that it doesn't modify the state. So a lot of things are, are simplified. For instance, the action doesn't have to return the state because it hasn't modified it. The state remains the same. Okay, so it's a simplified monad, and and in particular, I want to implement uh, a, my own version of a reader monad that's used only for the purpose of of proto. So this is the monad I'm, I'm going to implement. It's like a state monad with read-only state. So I will start with expression trees. Okay. Uh, these guys who, who were at the uh, Joel's talk or know about Proto from other sources can recognize this is expression trees. I'm starting with expression tree, um, and this is an example of an expression tree. Um, and this expression tree is constructed from three types of nodes. Constant nodes, which correspond to integers. We're dealing with integers only, okay? No floating point and it's just integers for simplicity. Uh, th and there are two placeholder nodes, arg1 and arg2, which corresponds to arguments that will be passed later. The values will be, will be passed later as state. Okay? And I'm not going to modify these arguments, although in proto you can, you can pass them by reference, I guess. And it has plus and times nodes. Just simple arithmetic. Minimum. Minimum example. It's a toy example. Um, state, in this case, will be this list of two arguments. Right? Two values that I'm going to pass. So it's like I'm, I'm constructing a lambda of two arguments. And when I'm done, I'll be executing this lambda by passing it three values that will be put in place of arg1 and arg2 in this expression, right? So an action in this case will just evaluate the corresponding expression. <coughs> and uh, these expression trees, uh, they, they are not part of the monad itself. These expression trees will be just what drives the composition of actions. Okay, so this is, this expression is like my source code to the program. Give me a tree. This is a source code. Okay, then I, from this tree, I compile a program, which is the action, and then I run this action. Okay, so now we have a conceptual model of, 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 of this stuff. So let me start. Um, so first I do this in Haskell, then I'll do this in C++. So in Haskell, um, my expression tree, <coughs> it's just a tag union, right? So I'm, I'm listing different kinds of nodes. And these are type, cons type, uh, type constructors for, for these nodes. So um, a node or expression could either be an const that takes an integer as an argument and stores it. Could be a plus that takes two expressions, arbitrary expressions. So this is recursive type definition. Could be a times that takes two expressions. Or it could be 
placeholder arg1 and or placeholder arg2. So that's my tree. This is how you define a tree in Haskell. Very simple. Right? It's a recursive definition. Yes? What's the state? The state will be, uh, I'll call it this type args, and it's a list of integers. Now I really need a list of two integers, but I'm being sloppy here, or maybe I'm being very general here. Yeah, in the future maybe I'll need more arguments. But, but this is the simplest data structure. <laughs> I don't have to explain more complex data structures. It's just a list of integers. That's my state. Okay, these are the values that I will be passing to my expression, the, the lambda, the placeholders. An action in the reader monad. You remember an action in the state monad that was something that takes state and returns a tuple, modified state and some value. Here I don't have to return the state, so, so the action is even simpler. It takes arguments, give me the arguments, I return you a value. So it's sort of like evaluates an expression. You know? Give me the two arguments, I'll give you the value. Okay, now, the monad. The first component of the monad is the type constructor. Right? So, my computation was, took some arguments and returned uh, some value of type A. That was the computation, the, the upper part of my picture, right? <clears throat> I'm turning it into a monadic function that returns a type that's more, that's the enhanced type. Before, the computation returns just the value of some type A. Now this guy is a function that takes state and, forget about this, returns a value. In reader monad there's no state. So it just takes state and returns a value. So this type, the function type, this is my enriched type. So give me any type and, my, and I will enrich it, enrich it to be a function returning this type. So this action, in, in Haskell, this action has to be encapsulated into a new data type. And this is for reasons that have nothing to do with, with anything, just, just that Haskell has to do type inference. So it has to have a new type for this. So I will call this new type program, prog, of type A, mm, program that returns A returns, let's say, A is an integer. In, in, in the rest of the stuff, this will be an integer. So it's a program that calculates an integer. And this is a type constructor, a constructor that I call PR, that takes an action. So it takes a function, right? A type constructor can take an, an arbitrary type. And in this case, it takes an action. So once I have a program, I want to run it. That means calculate my expression. So I, I write an auxiliary function run that takes a program and pattern matches it to extract the action. So it, it extracts this part, the function, the action. Right? And then just calls this action with the arguments. Very simple stuff. Right? So this is executing my expression. Now, monadic functions. Mo monadic functions are these functions that return this new enriched type. They correspond to some computations that used to return some type. Now, monadic actions actually instead return this enhanced uh, type. So I have to give you examples. And this is a, the first example is, is, is very important. It's useful. The other is, is non-useful, but just for, for the sake of argument. Um, the, the first monadic function is, is get arg. The computation that corresponds to it is just give me the nth argument. 
So I can call it with zero, it will give me the first argument. With one, it will take, give me the second argument. So just extract the argument, right? But this function <coughs> is supposed to return an action. It actually cannot extract the argument itself because it has no access to state, has not, no access to these arguments, right? It doesn't take any state as argument. It cannot. So this function is to produce a promise of extracting the argument. This function says, man, I don't have it right now, but I promise, as soon as I get my paycheck, you know, the argument, I'll do this for you, okay? Uh, so a function returning a function returns a lambda, right? So I have to create a lambda. So this lambda, this, this promise, uh, I encapsulate it as a program, and this is the action, the lambda. So when I get the arguments, man, what I'll do with it, I will take the nth element of the argument list. Okay, this is Haskell, nth element of a list. This is how you take, get it, okay? So that's, that's our first monadic function. The second monadic function is really trivial. I just need to, to have an example. So, uh, so it's, a f it's a monadic function that takes an integer and returns a, an action that will return double this integer. It will actually ignore the state. This is why it's so trivial. It will ignore the state. It really doesn't need the state. Right? So this is my monadic function. Double takes an argument n. Okay? And this is, think about the computation. Takes an argument n and returns 2 times n. Now you lift it, so it takes an argument n and returns the promise of returning 2n. Right? So it returns a lambda that takes arguments, promptly ignores them, and returns 2 times n. And of course you can see that this lambda is actually a closure, right? Because it grabs this n. Where, where does it get this n? From here. So this function grabbed this n, stored it somewhere, and when it's called, it just reaches for this n and returns double it. Yes? So what is a double there for? What, what is it so for? Double n equals... What what does the double what is the function of double there? Because it looks like a data type. Oh oh double no I, it, yeah there is no double type in, in Haskell. Oh I'm sorry. This is just a name of function. <laughs> Maybe I should call it double me. Okay. <laughs> yeah no no. <laughs> yeah so it's like return in Haskell is completely different thing. Double is completely different. Thing. That's a mess. What are you doing there? <laughs> Okay, now the second part of the monad is bind. Okay, so I have two monadic functions. These are functions that return promises. They don't really do something. They return promises to do something. But I want to combine them. And, and, and uh, this is a good example of combining these functions because the second one depends on the result of the first one. So I want to do something like the crazy thing, you know, I, I want to take the zeroth argument and I want to double it, okay? But when I'm calling get arg with zero, I don't get this value. I get a promise to get this value. And here I have another function that takes a value and returns a promise to double this value. How the heck do I combine these, right? When I combine these two, when I bind them, I want to get a function that will do both things. The one action that takes a zeroth argument doubles and, and gives it back to me. Okay? <coughs> so let's analyze this. Get arc with zero, it, uh, it's, it's a monadic function that creates an action. Right? Uh, so if I want to bind it, 
with the second function. Actually, bind doesn't take a monadic function, it takes a continuation. This is the rest of what you are supposed to do. What you are supposed to do when the first action is finished, you're supposed to take the result of the first action, okay? And do the rest of the computation with it. That's my continuation, right? So, when I'm doing the binding, right, I don't have this function yet. But when I will execute the action returned by bind, I will have the argument. And then, I can actually chain them. So, bind, in this case, will take the action. That's the action written by get arg0, in the previous slide. And the continuation, which is a function that takes some, value, some v, okay, so it's a lambda of v. This v will be later substituted by the result of the first action, right? Right now I don't have it, but I can write a function that takes it, right? So I write a function that takes the result of the first action and doubles it. And what the, bind, the whole bind is supposed to return, it's supposed to return a new action which will do both. A combined action. Okay? So we'll return type prog b. The first action is prog a. The continuation is something that takes a and produces a prog b. And here's the picture, okay? So I have two monadic functions. One monadic function, another monadic function, I want to combine them, okay? The first monadic function takes some arguments, returns an action, which takes a state and returns a value. Now my second monadic function, okay, it really wants to take this value here and put it as an argument to the second monadic function, right? But this argument will only be valid when this first action is executed, much, much, much later, right? And this monadic function will return an action that takes a state and returns the value, right? So this big box here is my continuation. Since I don't have this value that I will need, I will just write a function that takes this value and when it's called, it will do this. It will do the rest for me. Okay, so this is my continuation. So bind takes this result, okay, and the continuation and it will produce another action that combines these two. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, doesn't bind take the action and the continuation and not the value and the continuation? Bind, okay, bind takes the action and ta the takes the, yeah, takes this action. Right. Yeah. This is this is this is the argument to bind. Yeah. But it is a result of some monadic function. In our case get arg zero. Get arg zero will produce this action. Now we bind this action to this continuation. Yes. So how do we construct this bind? And this is the heart of the problem. Okay, so we start with this, um, the bind should return an action, right? So that, that we know that. So since it has to return an action, it will actually return a lambda, right? An action is a, is a function that takes arguments and produces some, ta some value of type B, right? And this forms an action that will be returned by bind. Okay? So this is an action. args returns b. So what's the body of this action? 
and, and, and notice that this lambda will be executed later when we already have the arguments. Okay? So this thing will actually have arguments at its disposal. So since it has arguments, it can do stuff. In particular, Right. In particular, it can do, it can execute the first action, right? Because now I have arguments. So let me just execute the first action. This first action will be, um, will be the, the action that takes the zeroth argument from the argument list, right? This is what it returns, right? So I'll call it at runtime, this will be done. The action will be executed on arguments, it will return some value. With this value, this is the value that the continuation was expecting, okay? With this value, I can call the continuation, okay? Continuation expects some value. It will do some stuff and return a new action, because this continuation was producing an action. So, here's this action, it's, I call it act prime. Okay, a continuation really returns a program, so I have to pattern match it to PR action. That's just a technicality, right? Um, okay, so I let V to be this in. What do I do with this, with this V uh, and act prime? I take this new action and I act on arguments. I execute this action, okay? This is, this is the new action, I execute it. And this produces my final value of type B. Okay? So, that's, that's your bind. It's pretty simple. Okay? And now look at this, the composition of get arg, get argument zero, and double. The same picture, but I filled out the, the boxes. Okay? So, get arg is a monadic function. Uh, I call it with an argument equal to zero, right? Get arg of zero. It will produce an action. <coughs> this is an action that will take state, arguments, and return some value. We'll return the value of the, set of the first argument, right? Now, this is my continuation. So, my bind will take will takes this action, and this is the continuation. The continuation expects this value, right? and pipes it into my second um, monadic function, double. Have yes? Question. If the uh, function would be in place double, or double me in place, how would the picture change? So this is your reading, right? You're reading the value and you're doubling it. Oh, oh you mean if, if this is really a state monad, in which you modify your arguments? If it would modify the, the zeroth argument, mm -hmm. How would the picture change? The picture would change in the way that action now will return not only a value but a modified state. Okay? And in the bind, when I call the second, when I, when I call the continuation, well, the result of continuation, I will use this modified state to pass to it. Okay? But I don't want to go into, into this, this level of detail. It's enough to, you know, understand this to, to get a little bit forward. <coughs> okay? So this is the picture. And this is this pictorial written in code. Okay? So, uh, I want to, co to create a new action that combines get arc zero and double v. Okay? Here's this. Um, here's this test. I call it test, which combines these two things. So it will bind the result of get arg zero, which is an action, with a continuation. A continuation takes this v, right, and, and, and returns double v. Mm -hmm. How does the, that lambda expression, uh, the, the, so the second argument, how does it differ from just uh, double, uh, the, the function double? It would appear that both take a one argument and uh -huh. well, well, the thing is that I don't have this V. I can't just call double. 
All right. No, he's right. Yeah. You could just directly pass double to bind. The lambda is redundant. Okay, but don't tell anybody. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Because we, I want to do it in a general way. Okay, in general, you have to you have to do this, and this is a special case in which you can cut it short. To lift double into. No, what I'm doing, I'm lifting the result of the double, double <coughs> sort of. No, actually, not even that. That is already a prog, so. Double returns a an action. So uh, so my yeah. test returns an action. Okay. Well, actually, it returns an action that's a combination of these two. So this is how you test it. Okay. So I call test zero, and I get a program. Right. <coughs> I run this program. Run. That was my auxiliary function that just takes the action and runs it. Uh, my program on three point three. The, a list of three and four. Right. I run, uh, okay, and it returns 6, because it takes the zeros argument and doubles it, right? I can run the same program on a different list, and it will give me a different result, right? Just like when you have a program, you run it with different arguments, you get different results. Now, this part is for Haskell people, really, uh, when you want to define, uh, well, except, except for return, okay? I, I haven't, the third part of the monad is, is return, right? So I have bind, <coughs> and here this bind is written out. This is, this is just the same code, except that I use the infix notation for it. Uh, return is defined as, you know, return takes a value, regular value, and it just returns an action that returns this value. So it just returns this value later, right? It, 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 it produces a promise to return this value. Uh, and in fact, monad is, is a type class in, in Haskell. So it has to define these two methods. And you say, this prog guy is actually an instant of a general monad. Right? And in fact, if I do this, then I can turn my little test program into a do notation. Do notation. So I get arc zero, put it in V, right? And the V is actually the result of running the action that's returned by arc zero. And I take this V and pass it to double. Okay, we won't be using the denotation, but I just want to show you, just to brag a little bit. Now we want to do some monadic programming. Monadic programming means let's define some functions, monadic functions using other monadic functions. And in this case, I want to I want to define a function called compile. Okay, and this function compile takes an expression and returns a program which produces an integer. And the idea is, I have this expression tree, okay? Do something with this expression tree, return me an action, and this action, when, when I give it arguments, these two arguments, it will evaluate this expression. So, since compile test takes an expression, and you remember expression was defined as, as this a bunch of type constructors. Uh, so I can, I can define compile case by case, right? So just match the expression to this pattern. If we cannot match it to the other pattern, and, and so on. I have, I have one, two, three, four, five patterns. Okay, I'll show you three of them, the interesting ones. So, uh, compile when it matches the const c. Okay, it will just return c. 
Now return, remember what return is. That's not like C++ return. This is this, this uh, special function that takes a value, C, and returns an action that will return C. So, so this compile is, is uh, a monadic function because it returns an action. So it has to return an action. I'm lifting the C into a monad. That's what they call Uh, matching plus, okay? That's an interesting case because when I match plus, I actually match two expressions, which can be arbitrary expression. So here I have to recurse, and maybe that answers the question about yeah, recursion. Um, <clears throat> so I have to call the compile function with the expression one, and I, I, I'm using the do notation. But actually, just, just for the moment, because I, I will unsugar it later. So you, you compile E1, and you get an action which will produce V1. Okay? Then you compile E2, which will return an action that will produce V2 in the future. Right? And finally, I want to return V1 plus V2. Return just takes these two actions, these two. Uh, this number produces v1 plus v2 and encapsulates it into a, an action. So that's the compilation of plus. It's a recursive, yeah? It doesn't, I mean, I, I guess my question was what actually happens if you, know, this, you want to make this dependent, the action done, dependent on the actual parameter passed in later? Can you do that or not? So if, for example, if, it's, if it ends up being, you know, one plus zero. If if arc zero is zero, then do this. If B two is zero, you don't do you know you <coughs> don't self destruction and you don't do the you just return for the rest of the Can you do that? Yes, I'm I'm sure you can do it. I'm I'm I don't know exactly the syntax for that. But but yes, definitely. <coughs> Oops, sorry. Matching arg1 node. So these are the three important cases. The other ones are just reflections of these. Matching arg1. So w when we compile arg1, <coughs> uh, it's, it's, it's just calling get arg of zero. Get arg of zero returns a, an action, right? So that's very simple. We have sort of already implemented it. <coughs> and of course arg2 will, will call get arg of one. We can test it. <clears throat> so this is how you build an expression. X times Y plus 13. Okay. So it's a plus node with two children. First child is times node with two children. Arg1 and Arg2. And the second child of plus is const 13. So what I do is, okay, so, so my args, I'm, I'm defining this args as, as a list of three, four. I call test expression, right, which will, okay, test expression, what does it do? Okay, <laughs> so that, that's, that's my uh, expression, okay? Now I take this expression and I compile it. So I'm calling this, this compile function, this compile monadic function that will do all this traversing of the tree and it will produce the final action that, that will do the calculation for me. So text expression, test expression returns an action that evaluates this expression. So here I'm evaluating it. I'm, I'm pa I, uh, these are my arguments, three and four. I call test expression to get my program, right? The, my compiled program. And then I run my compiled program with these arguments and I get the result. So this thing works. <clears throat> okay. Um, actually, we can skip this and, and go to the third hour. Do I have an hour? Uh, 45 minutes.
Any questions? So far? If I lost everybody? <laughs> I hope not. I hope not. So the third part is... Uh, so the result of all that is just another regular function. And then you're passing your define all that list of uh, <laughs> arguments in. Is that correct? The re the, the result of, of uh, compilation. Oh, the compile. Yeah. The compile. Yeah, it's an action. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So you just call this action. Okay. Okay, so the problem with with the with, uh, with Proto for me was that it makes the compile time and runtime. Okay, <clears throat> so I made this mapping in my mind: compile time. That's the combination of monadic functions. <coughs> runtime is the execution of the action. Okay. And from that point on, it was just a matter of filling in the detail. Okay, so that's the plan. We can skip. That's the teaser. Okay, I showed you this teaser before, but but now I, I highlighted the stuff. Okay, bind. See bind. You see lambda. That's the. These are the continuations. These are binds. There's a return. Okay. That's my function compile of plus, right? It becomes clear suddenly. No, <laughs> not <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so this is a short uh, explanation of domain-specific languages, which, if you if you attended uh, the previous talks, uh, you, you know. Okay, so here I'm going to just go ahead and do the translation for you. Okay, so let's start with expression tree. This is the stuff that we'll do at compile time, because my expression tree is just a type that's constructed at compile time. <coughs> but this is like very one-to-one -one correspondence here. Uh, const, for instance, is a type that's parameterized by some constant c. Okay, um, plus is a type that's parameterized by two expression types, expression meta types. I don't know, you should call it meta types probably. Now, if we had um, concepts, well, then I could say, okay, this, this, is, this is an expression. Right now, it's just generic type. But really, it's an, it's an expression super type. Okay. <coughs> times, okay, and the two structures, arg1 and arg2. So I, I translated all this stuff into types. So each, um, each of these constructors turns into a type. And notice that it looks like it's only five types, but really it's an infinite number of types, right? There's infinite number of plus types, depending on what a e1 is and e2 is. For every e1 and e2, this is a completely new type. That's why these things are called type constructors. They construct new types. You construct them like, like rabbits. My state will be a runtime thing, right? These are the values of these two arguments that I'll be passing to my actions. <coughs> so, in Haskell, it was just a list of two integers. In C++, I'm a little bit more fancy. I, I use an array of two integers. A constructor. Just the helpers, right? An operator. Just to help extract. But it's essentially the same thing, right? <coughs> now the type constructor. So, <coughs> first of all, action. That was something that took arguments and returned some type. Okay, so arguments. That's my state here, right? And then I define this type program that just encapsulated this action. So here, the, the idea is that prog, this will be something that's 
created the compile time using, using meta functions. But action will be executed at runtime. So here's this duality between compile time and runtime. This is something that I couldn't grok with, with Haskell before because of this duality. Now this PR here, this, this, this should really be a concept uh, and in C++ it's just uh, there is no correspondent for it. PR should be a struct that has operator function call defined. Okay, so this is my action here. This is my action. And PR is a constructor that takes it, that encapsulates this action. However, I cannot really express it in C++. I, I mean, if I put virtual here, then it would work. But I don't want this to be virtual because I want to do this as much as, as compile time as possible. I don't want runtime polymorphism to slow me down. And this is the main idea that made this work. So let's go back to the first hour. Remember meta functions. Meta functions uh, may return stuff. They may return values, right? So that was they they define the static const blah blah equals. So these were values. Uh, they can return types. I can have a type def inside the struct. Okay. They can return. Uh, Meta functions, yeah, I've shown you examples of returning meta functions. Now this is a new thing, it's a meta function that returns a function. And I can even generalize it further, and I think this will be necessary at some point, meta functions that return template functions. But let's just concentrate on, on meta functions returning functions. It's a Phoenix actor. Yeah? Yeah, exactly yeah. Phoenix actor. Cool. It's just implemented a bit differently, but it's uh -huh. exactly that. All right. So this is a meta function returning a function, which means it's a struct that has operator function call defined. All right. And that actually made all these things click into this monad thing. Okay, because now I can have a meta function that returns an action, what does it mean? It's a struct that has operator function call. <coughs> so let me define the meta function get arg, right? Get arg um, creates a lambda that returns an nth element of args, right? So <coughs> here it takes a compile time argument, integer n, right? It can be either 0 or 1. Let me don't check for this. Uh, get arg is the name of my meta function. Okay. Now I I I did this just you know to for um, this means nothing, right? Because my PR was defined as an empty thing. Uh, in in the f this should really be expressed as as a concept. So get arg is a is is a, is um, it's of type PR, of meta type PR. That's, that's what I wanted to express. Which means it, it returns a prog. <coughs> so it has operator defined, and, and this operator is, corresponds to my action. So it takes args, right, which will be provided in the future at runtime, and it returns args of n. Okay. Now this is this is like uh, the important part to understand. Okay, this correspondence between Haskell, Monad, and C++ Monad. I'll call it. Okay. Meta function. It's it's my monadic function in Haskell. It turns into a meta function takes some arguments, right, and it returns an action, 
which translates into it has operator function call defined. And this operator function call will be executed at runtime when the arguments are available and it will do the calculation, whatever calculation we want it to do. Yes? In Haskell, the construction of these functions of actions is done actually at runtime. It's not done at compile time. Yeah, yeah. In Haskell, everything is runtime. Yes, yes. Okay, so there's a. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I said it at the very beginning that, you know, in Haskell everything is runtime. In, uh, and I said in C++ everything is compile time. No longer. It's both. <coughs> bind. Okay, so bind was a meta function that took an action or a program and a continuation, right? And this is what it did with it. Okay, it just returned a new action, which is a lambda, right? It executed the program, the, the first argument on uh, the, the yeah on args. Took the value v, called the continuation with this v. It obtained a new program, and we ran this program on args. Now it translates one to one since it's a meta function, right? So this will be. Uh, a struct called bind. Uh, it takes two arguments, and, and this is a little tricky with these arguments, okay? P1 really corresponds to uh, to this first argument, PR of Prog. So, uh, the second one I'll explain a little later, but, but this, this sort of the second argument is, is this continuation. <coughs> But P2 is not really the type of the continuation, it's the type of the return of the continuation. Maybe it can be done differently, but this is like, I was, I was kind of struggling with C++ and this is the first thing that came to my mind. <clears throat> so the constructor of bind, so now we're talking runtime, takes this program and takes the continuation, and continuation is, is, a, is created by some kind of lambda, right? So I can match it to a standard function, right? It can be turned into a std function. And this is the, um, uh, this is the type of the function. It's a function that takes int and returns p2. This is the p2, okay. right? Now, in, uh, in Haskell, this was actually continuation was, was the argument. Here, the argument is, is the return type of the continuation. This is the real continuation. Okay. So the constructor just, just stores these two, right? because it captures the stuff. Um, stores them here, p1 prog, and, and here's the continuation stores them. And the dot 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 means <coughs> I have to define now the action that's returned by this meta function. So I have to define operator function call that takes args, right? <coughs> so this, this is the code in Haskell. This is this operator, this action that will be returned by bind as a meta function. It will have arguments available to it because it, it will be run at runtime, right? So I just uh, execute prog on these args, right? Just like I did here. It will give me some value. In this case, it will be an integer because it's a simplified thing, right? With this value, I can call the continuation continuation v, continuation v, sure, no problem. It will return a program, right? Sure, it returns a PR pro, prime, returns a program. <coughs> I can run this program with the arguments again. Program with arguments. Prog prime, prog two, not a big difference. And that's it. Straightforward translation.
So this is my monadic bind. This is my monadic return. Also very simple, you know. And so it's a return is, is now a meta function. Um, and it takes the argument in its constructor. So it's a runtime thing, right? Defines operator, it takes arguments, ignores them, and returns the value, which is stored. In, 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 uh, in Haskell, it was a capture, so here, it just stores it. So now I have bind, I have return, I have my type constructor, I have a monad. One level of abstraction done. Okay, this is my monad. I can forget about the details of how I created this monad. I can use it now. Next level of abstraction, I have the monad. I want to define a compile meta function. Okay, so compile was taking an expression tree and produced a, a program that returns an int. Um, <coughs> Here it takes the expression, compile time expression. So that's my expression tree at, that I created at compile time. So it's, it's really this complex type that corresponds to my expression. Okay? And, and this is my forward declaration, really. Because I, I will have to specialize compile, just as I did before in Haskell. I have to specialize it to all possible expression patterns. Right? But that's pretty straightforward. So let's do some simple specialization. Compile const c. It was just returning c, right? Um, so I could, I could define the operator function call for this, uh, but this is really noise. Because return already defines operator function call for me. So I can just inherit this operator, because it does exactly what I want. I just have to construct this return with this value C. Because what does return do? It produces a meta function, it produces an action that takes arguments, right, ignores them, and returns the value C. So that's it. Um, when I compile arg1, I really don't have to do much. I just use get arg of zero, right? Same in, in uh, C++. So this is a specialization of compile for arg1. It just inherits get arg of zero. It is just get arg of zero. Inherits means it is equals. That was my meta function that I defined in the beginning. Get arg of it. Now well, here's the beautiful code, okay? Now, this is the, uh, the, you can understand this. You should be able to understand it now. This, is, this was my teaser, okay? Here's the, here's the code in Haskell. It's still mu much more compact than, than in, in C++. Plus, I have these dot, dot, dot that I will fill later. <clears throat> but essentially, so compile, when it matches plus, expression left, expression right, so template class L class R, uh, compile of the pattern plus L R. Okay? It returns, returns an action, this lambda. I think I don't have a PR here, that's like an older version which, when there was no PR. Uh, but 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 in 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 um, C plus plus is actually simpler. I don't have to encapsulate the action in anything. <clears throat> uh, so so the first thing I do is I bind. Okay, what did I write here? Bind. Okay, first thing is bind. This is unsugared. I, I, I previously I wrote it in do notation, but this is the unsugared do notation. <clears throat> so I have to bind what? I have to compile expression left, 
right? Ex compiling expression left returns me an action, and this action has to be bound to the continuation. And here's the continuation. The rest of the code is continuation. It's a continuation that takes left. This will be actually the result of running left subtree, right? And it does bind, compile the right subtree, okay, with another continuation. This continuation takes right as an argument, and it calls return of left plus right. So, probably you don't remember the details of this, but but uh, but this is this is uh, what I explained before. So <coughs> the translation is this: we have to construct an object of type bind, and and here are the the template arguments which uh, I will fill later. So I'm constructing the object of type bind and passing it two things: compile expression left and the continuation. So this is the object compile L. I'm constructing this object here. That's my first argument to bind. The second argument of bind is the continuation, which is a lambda. This is the C++ lambda, right? This lambda takes left, and what does it do? It creates an object bind, which takes object compile right subtree, and the continuation, this one. This continuation takes right, and by the way, it captures left. In Haskell it was a implicit, I mean all lambdas were captures, well, were um, um, closures, right? Here I have to be explicit in C++. So I'm, I'm capturing left, because I need both left and right. So I, so I add left to right, and I, and I uh, create an object return. Okay? And then I call all of this with arguments. I know it's still not very clear, but, but as, at least you see that there is a path between these two, right? And I, now I was able to, to define my compile in terms of monad, right? So I, I, I skipped one level of abstraction and now I'm on the higher level of, uh, of abstraction. I'm defining a meta function compile, but I'm using as my building blocks what monad is providing me. And each, each level higher I go, the more f freedom I have. I can, I can do with this monad different things. I, here I define the meta function compile. Maybe I can define something else, right? Using the same monad. Um, this is how I fill the types. I mean, in C++, I, 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 have to, I have to put the types in. But you do this backwards, so... Uh, you just see, okay, what is this continuation returning? It's returning an object of type return. Okay? So, my bind will take object of type compile R and an object of type return, and so on. This is just details. Here's my test. So, I create this expression in Haskell, and here I create this expression in uh, C++. So it's a plus of times of R1, R2, cos 13. Okay, and I call this, and I, and I compile this. So a meta function compile takes this argument. This is my, my, my uh, expression tree. Compile takes expression tree. This is done compile time, it returns an action. It's an object that has operator uh, uh, function call. So I can take this object action and call it like a function, right? 
with these arguments. These are my arguments, three and four. And it returns a value, and I print this value. And this works. There's one more step necessary <coughs> if I want to really impress the proto people. I want to have a lambda EDSL, so I want to be able to write something like this and then call it with 3, 4. Now I have all the tools for, to do this. Okay? So, what I, what I need is, I have to define these objects arg1, arg2, and arg2, uh, arg1 and arg2 as special types for which operator plus and operator star are defined. Okay? So that's what I have to do. And the compiler, when, when it parses this, it will, uh, it will see what the, what the types of arg1 and arg2 are. So it will know what operators to call, what overloaded operators to call, and it will what types do these operators return. It will combine them, and it will find the final type that's produced by this. And this final type, that's my tree at compile time. And I will turn this tree into an executable object and call it. That's it. Yes? It's not really a, a tree, it's a sequence of operations. No, it's a tree. Is it a tree? It's a tree. It is a tree. I mean, you can imagine it's a tree. I mean, it is serialized, but it's... Yeah, in normal special templates, it's a tree, right? But in order to... It's a self-recursive type. It's a what? It's a self-recursive type which represents the expression it has been built from. Yeah, but... I mean, isn't the point of this that you can also have side effects in each of these operations? Right? The whole point of the monads was that you can have... No, this is not the whole point of the monads. No, no. I mean, in general, you can have... Uh, there are many, many monads. But there's a state monad which does side effects. And there is a smaller monad, sort of, sub-monad, when you don't have side effects, but you still have state. So you don't modify the state. And in your case, I just simplified stuff. I don't want to modify the arguments. So it's a simpler monad, easier to write, easier to understand. But of course, you can go back to a monad that modifies its arguments and, and so on. This is not necessary. It's just that for, for the sake of this argument, I, I chose the simplest thing. OK, so I, I have to. Uh, so what the what the mona, uh, proto guys call this? They they this is the extension, extend, extend something like that, right? Extend. Yeah. So you define a a new class, a new uh, type, which I will call lambda, um, which has an operator function call which takes two arguments, because that's what I want. I want to, to, you know, to create an object of type, type lambda and call it with two arguments. So this is my object lambda. This is its operator. It's, it's called with two arguments. What do, I, what do I do with these arguments? I stuff them into my type args. Okay, what do I do with my type e? I compile it. This type E is this my really huge tree. Okay, well, in this case, it's not a huge tree, but it's a tree. It's a type that was constructed using, using these nodes, right? So I can compile it, and I will get an object that has operator um, function call defined, right? So this is my compiled program. You take this program, I call it with arguments, and return. And I'm done. Well, I'm not done yet because I have to define these uh, arg1 and arg2. But arg1 and arg2 are just defined as uh, lambda of arg1, lambda of arg2. Right? Lambda with a, with a simple expression, the simplest expression, the leaf expression arg1, leaf expression arg2. So these are my two objects. And I'm almost done, except I have to overload the operators, right? <clears throat> so
So if you look at this expression, okay, so let's say op op operator plus, okay, plus. Uh, operator plus takes arg1. What is arg1? It's a lambda. Okay. Uh, this, the second argument is also some kind of lambda. Okay. So operator plus takes two lambdas. Okay. And, and these lambdas are parameterized by my expressions, the original expressions. Right? So it's a, it's a template that depends on E1 and E2, on these two expressions. These are the naked expressions the guys were talking about, right? These are the naked expressions. They are uh, encapsulated inside lambdas. But what I really need is I need these naked expressions, because with these naked expressions, right, I can create a plus node. And encapsulate it into a lambda. So this is what my operator plus returns. It returns a um, a lambda of the expression plus e1 e2. Okay. I mean, I know the things are getting complex. But 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 there, you have these many levels of abstractions that you can you can build on top. Okay, so why is it the margin here? Okay, so this is how the the compiler sees it. It sees this expression. At compile time, it it looks okay. So uh, what are the types of these things? Arg one, that's lambda of arg one. Arc two has a type lambda of arc two. Arc2 has a type of lambda of arc2. So these are my original types. Okay. Now, operator star multiply. When it's called with these two arguments, with these two lambdas, what it does it extracts these guys, creates a multiply node with these two guys, and encapsulates them in a lambda. So the type of this is lambda of times arc2, arc2. So this is the, the type of this whole thing here. Uh, but now we have operator plus. Do I have an overload of operator plus? It takes a lambda of arg1 and lambda of something like this. Sure I have one. I, I just showed you before, right? What it does it extracts the original types, the original expression types, combines them into times. Times are, uh, no, plus, so plus. So this is plus of arg1 times of arg2, arg2. So it sort of uncloses this, combines, closes it back into, into a lambda. <clears throat> so at runtime, it has this object of this particular type, and this object happens to have uh, an operator function call defined. And in this particular case, this operator, what will it do? It will compile this expression with which it was called, which is plus arg1 times arg2 arg2, to produce a prog. And now I run this prog on my arguments and I get the result. So I have an EDSL defined. One moment, let me see what, I, what else I have. Okay, not much. Okay. Uh, just a small, uh, one question, a small comment. Why are you extracting the arc2 from the lambda? Why can't you build a lambda times lambda arc2 lambda arc2 nodes? which is basically what we do with Proto, we never extract whatever is in the expression node. Yeah, I know, I know. Uh, actually, is it, I, is I didn't know that much about Proto when I wrote this. Okay? <laughs> so, I know you guys do it a little differently because you also, you also have this additional thing, transform. Yeah. And, and I think transform is actually the, the monad. No, it's a compile. No, com your compile node is a is a proto transform. Yes. 
Okay. This is why I needed you to explain to me what I was doing. <laughs> and, and the small detail is that the real runtime part is after compile has been mushed up by the compiler and gave you something you can actually run. Yeah. The only runtime part is actually feeding x and y values to what <coughs> the compile program is. Mm -hmm. Because if, if you say that compile works at runtime, it sounds like we're making a just-in-time compilation, which is wrong. No, no, compile is a meta function. It runs at compile time. What, what happens is runtime is that you feed your arguments to whatever the compile result is. This. This is runtime. Yeah. Compile is, is a meta function. It, it's done during compilation. Yeah. So is, I mean, it's the monad feature. That's not an essential feature for this example at all, right? So is that... Well, if you ask proto guys, I mean, they came know. up with all this stuff without any monads. Without any, yeah. Yes. Without and, and it's amazing. It's amazing that they were able to do this without monads. We I couldn't understand this, so this is why I came up with this. But you could have side effects in here. That's the, that's the key. I could have side effects if I wanted. And in Which, in this particular example, I didn't want to complify no. things. Because I think in, in Proto, if you have start to have side effects, then things start to blow up, don't they? Uh, you, you can have side effects as a part of the runtime execution of a transform. Yeah. A modified state. That modified state or print out stuff, mm -hmm. whatever. Yeah. But how can you, do you, can you rely on which order things are going to get executed? What, what happens is that a compiler has a transform which basically builds small blocks that would lead the compiler to aggregate small, smaller function calls into whatever you want them to be called depending on the structure of the tree. And at runtime, the only stuff that you do is basically going through all these small function calls yeah. and you do whatever side effect or IO you need in each of them. Yeah. Yeah. So I notice a big difference between what I did and, and uh, Proto is that you guys actually went for Templatizing the, the operator function call, which I didn't get, I didn't do that. But templatizing operator function call corresponds to a meta function that returns a template function. No, that's because you are constrained yeah. to integers. Yes. And what Phoenix is doing, because essentially, I mean, I, I think I had. The, the very similar example yesterday in the talk, right? Mm -hmm. Arg1 plus add, 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 add. Yeah, yeah. And if you make it templatized, you can just pass any argument to that expression you created. So that's why we have templates on the operators, on the on the function operators, to allow polymorphism. Yeah. Yes. 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 Yeah. The I s uh, there's probably more reasons. But that's the, probably the most important reason, yeah, yeah. I also cheated, I, I, I can tell you what things are, are, are cheats here. Um, you see this expression here? <laughs> it doesn't have any consts. Because um, constants create a problem. Okay, if, if, you, if, if your expression tree con contains, let's say, const 7, where 7 is an integer, you might think, okay, so I could templatize it by, by an integer. But if you have a const 3.14, you can't use it at, at, at compile time, right? No way. So if I want to do stuff like this, I really, the, these const, consts have to be passed at runtime as part of the state. And what Proto is doing, it's passing the state as a little tree, right? See, I didn't do this tree. Um, I just ignored. I, I just look, look at my operator plus. Where's my operator plus? Oh, here, here, right? What does it do with E1 and E2? E2? Ignores it. Ignores it. It shouldn't really, because E1 and E2 will contain the constants, right? I actually wrote a version of this that dealt with constants, uh, but it, in a very 
no, not satisfactory way. It was just actually pushing these constants on a stack and then when it was executing it was popping them. It just happens it, it's done in the same order so it fits, right? But a const here, an integer, right? So I would have, take this integer, I would wrap it and, and put it here. So that's why you need to keep the lambda whatever around what you put in your nodes. So if you have an int which is not lambda whatever, you can just say lambda fit and keep it inside. Exactly. It's not to have it's, it's, Yeah, it's, it's the lambdas that keep state. Yeah. It's the lambdas that keep the, this part of the state, the constants. Yeah. I mean, a, a proto-expression essentially is, is itself a runtime compile time beast. It has a type which is generated from the expression, and it carries the values which correspond to the, to the things you have in your expression. So it, it, it's a fusion. Concept. Yes, yes. But in, in lunatic language, these things are runtime. It's, uh, these things are state. Sure, and that's what we have to discuss to make to turn Proto from its head to onto its feet to get it on a, on a theoretical basis. Yes, yes. <laughs> Let me just show you a few few things to, to end the stock. Um, where was I? Okay, uh, you would like to be able to write everything in Haskell first. Okay, so this is the Haskell way of writing the lambda thing. Okay, the only difference is that in Haskell you don't have oper operator function call overloading, so I created this um, this function too fun, which takes an expression and sort of returns its operator function call. So these are uh, these are my conclusions, and I think the most important part of the conclusions. Is, uh, is, is this last one, is, is that <coughs> you get these multiple abstraction levels because when you try to learn Proto, you are just hit with a ton of bricks all at once. It's like everything relates to everything. You can't really understand these things separately. Here you can build a layer of abstraction upon a layer of, of abstraction. So your bottom layer is this monad. On top of this monad, you can forget how it's implemented, you build meta functions like compile. And then, forget about this, now you, using these meta functions, you can build your uh, your lambdas, for instance, or whatever you want, your DSL. This is where you build your DSL, on top of this. So you have these levels of abstraction, and once you are familiar with one of them, you can forget about the details and go another level, and another level, and so on. And these are things that I just came up with, uh, like, what, 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 what could be done with this in the future. So, so first thing that comes, comes to mind is this meta functions that return template functions. And this is what Proto is doing, right? And, and we can have this in, in the monadic language as well. Um, a better story on const, definitely, because I, I just cheated here. And I would like to understand how to factor out the transform and domain of, of Proto. Yeah, to turn it into monads. Yeah. Turn this stuff into monads. And then once you have the monads, you can start proving things. Right? Yeah. You can prove the correctness of, of your DSL. Or worse than that, you can actually make your uh, transform such that whatever kind of template tree you get DSL and that you want to turn into uh, an arbitrary other representation, uh, you can actually prove it does what you say it does. Mm -hmm. actually, I think it's something which is extremely interesting to look at because there's a lot of reticence uh, all over the places about getting, uh, let's say, not even proto based but execution template based systems into uh, some places because people require that they can actually 
uh, guarantee that the stuff that we say happens actually happens. And it's thinking of happenings or whatever. Mm -hmm. We can actually uh, make this bridge between uh, uh, what we do and what, what you do and the Aspen world. I think both of the stuff can actually be uh, very, you know, fruitful. Uh, because it's basically the last stuff we can go past. We, we have no way, by just looking at the simple uh -huh. code, that we say, oh yeah, we can trivially demonstrate it does what we want to say it does. Right. Does the spirit parser really does what it's advertising, right? Does it really match the input sequence it's, yes. it's supposed to match? Uh -huh. And that we, we could prove this way. Right. And you know what, uh, another experience uh, thing that I experienced while doing this is <coughs> I first wrote these things in Haskell and then translated in, into C++. And so I had a prototype in Haskell. I could test it, I could run it very quickly, right? Then I did the translation and what happened is that in, in, uh, in the process of translation I generated this extremely complex template code and it actually worked. Because if I started getting these uh, errors, template errors, I would, I would have given up. But because I started with the Haskell and I proved the concept and I did mechanical, almost mechanical translation, this thing was guaranteed to work. Compile. You even could have generated it from the Haskell code. Yeah. Probably. Because if it's so much mechanical, it should be fully mechanical at some point. Yeah, I think so, yeah. Wouldn't that cool? You oh, develop yeah. your, your DSL and generate the product? Whatever, yeah, sure. Everything. <laughs> we need a specific parser to parse hack Haskell. Right. <laughs> 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 Maybe we can bootstrap ourselves. No, uh, I don't know if you if you know that two years ago we had a guy presenting a yeah. solution of having a Haskell type system where he developed a, a certain meta program with Haskell, proved it, and then he switched one type in the type in the ha one Haskell type and it generated an MPL program. Yeah. Which is do, was doing the same thing, and you could do the same thing here. Just you develop it in Haskell, mm -hmm. you switch one one switch, and it generates a protocol. You n you need to to represent that in, in C plus plus or so. <coughs> should should be possible. Yeah. <coughs> well, I'm very happy that this actually turned out to be an interesting yeah. idea. Yeah. Well, thank you very much.